Secretary Bruce Babbitt and Agriculture Secretary Dan Glickman. Today they testified before the House Resources Committee on the American Heritage Rivers Initiative. The initiative is a White House plan that would deem certain rivers important enough to receive special protection that limit development. This hearing lasts a little over three hours. Committee will come to order. Chairman Don Young has asked me to uh, chair this hearing at this time. I'm Jim Hansen. I represent the First District in Utah. This morning, the committee will hear administration testimony on the controversial American Heritage River Initiative. This oversight hearing is a result of tremendous public outrage and concern expressed to the Congress during the past several months and the need to have accountability for the federal agencies undertaking this activity. This committee has jurisdiction over the Council on Environmental Quality, the Department of the Interior, and the Forest Service under the direction of the Department of Agriculture. This hearing will raise serious questions about federal agency participation in and coordination of this initiative throughout the United States and may very likely lead to further congressional oversight hearings in order to provide the American public an opportunity to express their concerns on this issue. This morning, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. This hearing this morning was proposed from the original date of June 26, 1997 at the request of the Council on Environmental Quality. Furthermore, through negotiation between this committee and the Council on Environmental Quality, the testimony of these five administration witnesses was agreed to. Although this committee originally requested that all 12 federal agencies involved in the implementation of this initiative provide testimony. We appreciate the attendance of Kathleen McGinty, uh, Secretary Bruce Babbitt, Secretary Glickman, and we haven't had the opportunity to have our former colleague, Mr. Glickman, before us before. It's a pleasure to have him here. Uh, Dan was a joy to work with on legislation, and we, uh, I think, accomplished some good things. And the administration appointees before the committee this morning and look forward to their testimony. The President first mentioned the American Heritage Rivers Initiative during the State of the Union Address on January the 4th, 1997. The basic thrust of the American Heritage Rivers Initiative is that the President will designate by proclamation 10 rivers during the calendar year with the potential for an unlimited number to follow at a later date. Rivers will be nominated by communities, submitted plans to a federal interagency task force that will make recommendations to the President. This vague and broad statement, which has no prior coordination within the executive branch, has resulted in the Council on Environmental Quality coordinating this initiative within the Cabinet and involving at least 12 federal agencies. This far-reaching initiative involves designation of federal, state, and private lands in 10 so-called American Heritage Rivers that will encompass hundreds of miles of shoreline involving multiple overlapping city, county, and state jurisdictions, and in fact, international boundaries. For example, Council on Environmental Quality documents specifically refer to the potential of designating the entire length of the Mississippi River under one U.S. Army Corps of Engineers district and hundreds of miles of the Rio Grande River forming the boundary between Texas and Mexico. This Committee on Resources has the congress congressional jurisdiction over designation of federal lands, wild and scenic rivers, trails, wilderness, recreation areas, and heritage areas, among other considerations. The Committee and the Congress sometimes take decades to reach consensus on these designations and eventually pass laws authorizing the establishment. The unauthorized proclamation of such areas by the President will, at a minimum, create confusion with the public, American public, and at worst is a direct challenge to congressional jurisdiction and authority. Following the May 19, 1907 publication of notice in the American Heritage River Initiative in the Federal Register, this committee requested an extension of the public comment period for 90 days until September 9, 1997. On June 20, 1997, the administration provided for only 60 more days of public comment until August 20th, 1997. Today, this committee formally requests an additional 60 days of public comment until October 20th, 1997. This time will allow the American public and local and state elected officials to have an adequate opportunity to address this issue. Media and press reports, private citizens and organization accounts Council on Environmental Quality documents requested by this committee all reveal 
that a disturbing case for federal agency misconduct seems to be developing. Meetings were held with limited public notification and involvement. Special invitation only meetings were held and county and state government agencies have not been involved. Furthermore, there are reports and of federal employees promising enhanced or priority funding for rivers designated under this initiative. The administration has informed this committee that there are no FY 1997 or FY 1998 funds specifically authorized or appropriated for this American Heritage Rivers Initiative. However, documents provided by the Council on Environmental Quality describe a federal program that will be created by executive order issued later this summer that will require reprogramming of over two million of agency funds for this initiative. For instance, the so-called river navigator position will cost over 100,000 per designated river and will be utilizing federal employees. Staffing and meetings for a so-called blue ribbon panel will cost over 300,000. In addition, the long-awaited toolbox of agency information on resources available to designate rivers will cost over 300,000 in staff and production costs. The staffing estimates do not account for the federal employee currently involved in the federal interagency task force, but does reflect that these federal employees are involved full-time on this project. I'm increasingly concerned with the administration's arrogance and abuse of unilateral presidential actions, creating of the ill-conceived Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, cutting huge land deals on the Headwaters Forest and the Crown Butte Mine are all examples of executive actions taken without congressional approval. This committee has already demonstrated that the monument was purely politically driven. And all you have to do is go down and spend months on it, as I have, and you'll see that. Moreover, now the administration wants Congress to bail them out of the headwaters and Crown Butte land deals, because once the political advantage of this announcement wears off, there is no substance to these actions. And now this new river initiative that again appears to be politically motivated. Yes, once again, documents provided by the administration reveal that politics is a major consideration in the designation of these rivers. I don't believe there is a member of Congress who does not believe in conservation. However, this nation believes in a democratic process that provides for debate and refining of ideas. This committee looks forward to the testimony we will receive from the distinguished panel this morning. The committee members have been have many questions to ask following your prepared remark. So I hope that your schedules have been arranged to remain until we have completed all questions from members of the Committee of the Record. I ask unanimous consent that the former member of this committee, Doc Hastings, be allowed to sit on the dais. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. The gentleman from California, Mr. Uh, Miller. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'd ask unanimous consent that the statement by uh, Mr. Pallone of the committee be inserted in the record, Without and objection. that my, rec my statement be inserted in the record in its entirety, and I just want to say that I, uh, I welcome our distinguished panel of witnesses uh, here today, and I strongly support the American Heritage uh, Rivers Initiative. I believe that this is an important initiative to try to coordinate uh, state, local, and federal efforts at, at, uh, at watershed management and, and helping local communities to, uh, uh, to reach a consensus on how we, uh, how we manage the, uh, uh, the rivers. Uh, I, this, the, this theme of, of management of these water resources has been explored in the Water Policy Review Commission, uh, which I sit as a, as a member, and uh, have been taking testimony from local communities about, uh, about the management of these rivers. Uh, obviously, uh, there can be no discussion of, of American history, American culture, and American heritage without the discussion of America's rivers. And uh, uh, unfortunately, too often we find too many of our rivers uh, in serious trouble because of a lack of, uh, of, of coordination, a lack of local input, and a lack of, uh, of good decision-making processes. And hopefully, uh, the, this, uh, uh, this initiative uh, will bring to, uh, to these watersheds and to these communities uh, uh, the help that is necessary so that we might, uh, we might engage in better decision making uh, about uh, our, uh, our rivers. And uh, I look forward to the testimony of the, uh, of the witnesses. Thank you, gentlemen from California. I can see that uh, we have quite a few members here and I'm sure more will be coming. Uh, I'm sure most of you have opening statements. So we've got a lot of ground to cover and a lot of witnesses. We have our two secretaries and uh, Chairman of the Council, I would appreciate it if we could be brief in our opening statements. So I'll start with the, in the order they arrived, Mr. Hill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important oversight hearing. 
<clears throat> as with most federal programs, this initiative seems uh, well intended, particularly for those communities that are interested in finding new tourism opportunities. However, as with all proposals, the devil is in the details. A lot of questions need to be asked today. For example, will the American Heritage Rivers Initiative serve as a simple non-regulatory purpose, or is it an incremental approach that will lead to more infringements on local sovereignty and individual property rights? Moreover, what effect will this have on the American taxpayer, particularly when Congress has not authorized the initiative? Mr. Chairman, I strongly believe we need to find answers uh, to these questions on behalf of the American people, the people of Montana. They deserve nothing less than accountability from the Congress and from the White House. I look forward to closely examining the proposal and hearing from our distinguished witnesses again. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Gentle lady from the Virgin Islands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, I think it's a great initiative which the President announced during his State of the Union address. It's community-based and nominated and still coordinates the efforts of many federal agencies. And it's yet another program to help rebuild and America's towns and cities as well as restore some of our important natural resources. As I welcome the panelists and look forward to their testimony, I think about a river out of our Virgin Islands past, Salt River, the only point within the United States where Columbus actually has, was known to have landed. It's a great historical area and a valued natural habitat. While we had not planned to restore the entire river, the estuary is in need of restoration and protection, and it has the potential for wonderful recreational tourism and educational development. I wonder if it would qualify for this program, and I hope that during the course of this morning that could be answered for me. And I'm just pleased to join you, Mr. Chairman, and the rest of my colleagues and welcome our panelists this morning. Thank you. The gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Gibbons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, I want to thank you and the leadership of this committee for having this hearing here today. I welcome the guests who are going to be testifying as well. I think the purpose of this hearing, of course, should be to answer some of the questions that we have as members of Congress as to whether or not uh, such a designation as this should be actually authorized by Congress, should it be an administrative procedure, whether or not there was sufficient uh, time given to the public of this country to have uh, sufficient input into the process. As a result, I'll be very interested to hear some of the answers that are going to be proposed here today uh, in, in relationship to those, and I welcome the opportunity to participate in this hearing, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Pickett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time and hearing the, what our witnesses have to say today, I'll submit my statement for the record. Thank you. The gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief also, but I uh, do want to associate myself with uh, the Chairman's remarks and to also indicate that it is of great concern to me and my constituents that we now face yet once again in this arena uh, the same battle which we seem to fight constantly these days, and that is whether all wisdom does flow from Washington. Uh, I can tell you that I've just come from a meeting where we've been discussing some of the water and river issues in my community. and. Uh, if you want to see how another federal task force or a federally managed program can foul up a river system, just take a look at the Columbia River system in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the last thing we need is another federal initiative to move federal management into decisions of this type of nature. Uh, I've introduced legislation that would require the federal government to comply with state substantive and procedural water law with regard to the allocation, management, and use of water. And it's of concern to me that this initiative not only seems to move back toward the approach of saying that all wisdom comes from a federally managed task force, but it seems to say that uh, that wisdom, which some seem to think flows only from Washington now, flows only from the executive branch in Washington. It appears to me that we have a lot of important questions to answer today about not only the wisdom of this initiative uh, at all, but how it has been proposed in a manner which excludes Congress from any effective involvement in development of policy regarding the management of the nation's rivers. Thank you. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the uh, people in my state are quite concerned over the initiative, but I think not so much uh, um, because they know of many details. There were not that many disclosed, quite frankly, but because of the manner in which it was uh, introduced and suggested in the congressional record, given a very short period of time for public comment, and that uh, has really uh, uh, caused a number of folks that I represent to uh, view this whole initiative with some degree of skepticism. Uh, that also taken in, in light of what hap has happened in our, our neighboring state with the uh, 
uh, the Grand Scare, uh, Staircase uh, Escalante Heritage uh, Program there, done uh, in large uh, part uh, without the uh, knowledge of, of the congressional delegation, the governor, the members of the legislature in their home state, in fact announced from a neighboring state, not even from the, the, the state that was affected. Uh, several examples like this that, that we have heard, uh, re discussions about reintroduction of grizzly bears in Idaho to the uh, to the objection of, uh, of members of that state, the entire delegation in that case, almost, uh, as I recall, unanimous uh, opposition in the state legislature. Uh, in Kentucky as well, this uh, uh, biosphere initiative as well has, uh, has uh, in the same way, uh, encouraged the opposition of the Kentucky state legislature. Yet these initiatives continue to move forward and be pressed by the administrations represented here today uh, portions of the administration represented here today, and it's for those reasons that I think the citizens and taxpayers throughout the country, and rightly so, view these programs with uh, and this initi initiative with great skepticism, and uh, and um, uh, hopefully, as a result of this hearing here today, we'll uh, be a little bit more knowledgeable about the intents and the uh, the um, objectives of the the uh, Clinton administration. General lady from Idaho, Mr. Chenoweth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have been outspoken on this issue, this initiative, since I first read about it in the Federal Register, and it is no secret I am adamantly opposed to it. I think my colleague from Idaho uh, very clearly stated uh, what our Western perspective is. It seems like every time I open the Federal Register, there's a new effort by the Federal Government to, uh, to become the nanny of the Western resources from the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management's proposed law enforcement regulations, uh, which is a direct assault on the Constitution in many ways, um, to the lockup of uh, billions of dollars in resources over uh, the uh, um, Escalante uh, National Monument uh, set aside, which took private rights and uh, state property. I'm very disturbed and very suspicious, and we have a right to be. Today, we examine the American Heritage Rivers Initiative, initially proposed May 19, 1997, with only a three-week comment period, which was <clears throat> thankfully extended. Uh, the American Heritage Rivers Initiative creates a new, a new entity called the River Community, which is not defined, um, to propose a, a new designation. It establishes a river navigator, a federal official, to help guide the river community through the designation process. Interestingly, this river navigator is tapped to be a GS-13 to a GS-15, to the tune of up to $100,000 salary a year, all, Mr. Chairman, without congressional authorization. Ten rivers per year, the possibility of ten rivers per year, ten times river navigators, at $100,000 salary per year is $1 million just in salary per year. The river navigator's tenure is five years. That's $5 million plus 10 additional rivers per year. The numbers start adding up pretty fast into the millions. Last time I checked, the constitutional role of Congress is to authorize the funds. And I don't remember authorizing $5 million um, per year for river navigators. Do you, Mr. Chairman? Probably the most offensive and alarming issue here is the scope or area covered by these nominations. A designation may include the length <coughs> of uh, the area, with whether it be an entire watershed, the length of the entire river, and may cross jurisdictional boundaries, as you stated. This can literally mean, by definition, from mountaintop to mountaintop, and given that the Mississippi Mississippi River drains approximately 40% of the U.S. mainland, 40% of the U.S. could conceivably be an American Heritage River. Mr. Chairman, um, whether this designation has legal teeth or not is not the issue. The issue is private and state property rights and self-determination and state determination. The Idaho Constitution and Code, like many Western states, expressly claims all waters within its boundaries as states' waters. How can we allow the federal government to designate something it doesn't own? If the Clinton administration is truly serious about American heritage rivers, let's take the $5 million they are taking from uh, other on-the-ground programs and clean up our historical surroundings. It is an embarrassment to this nation 
when people from around the nation and around the world come to the capital of the United States to watch people pull fish from the tidal basin with blisters on them and open sores, and to watch garbage and tires floating around as one gazes out from the historic Thomas Jefferson Memorial. The Anacostia and the Potomac Rivers are historic and certainly part of our heritage. The rivers were used by explorers and settlers to trade with the Native Americans, by the British in an effort to hold on to the colonies, and by the architects of our capital city to bring marble and granite into Washington to build a federal city. And the Hudson Bay and other places full of history need our attention. I would suggest to the Clinton administration they take on these projects first. And when they have brought these projects up to a standard that they're satisfied with, that can then be the measuring standard by which they measure all other rivers that they wish to take into this particular program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a full statement <coughs> that I'd like to enter into the record with your permission. Without objection. Thank you. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Henshaw. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, express my appreciation to you for holding these hearings and uh, thereby giving us an opportunity to look into this very important subject of American rivers. And uh, I, I want to say that I've been excited about this program ever since the President announced it in the State of the Union address uh, earlier this year. I think it's a terrific idea and one that ought to be supported by all of the American people. I can tell you that the people in my district do support it. In the intervening period between his announcement of the program and today, my uh, district office has had numerous calls from people on a bipartisan basis, Republicans and Democrats, even the state government in uh, New York, which of course is, uh, is currently a uh, Republican state government with a Republican governor, strongly supports the program and has spoken out uh, in favor of it, much to their credit. But most of the support that we've seen has come from nonpartisan organizations, environmental, civic, other organizations stretching all along the Hudson River, excited about the prospects of this program, looking forward to it, and hoping that the Hudson River will, in fact, merit the designation of one of America's uh, national heritage rivers. It's a very, very exciting program. Of course, there have been those who have raised uh, the specter of government control, which, of course, in the context of this particular program is, uh, is nonsense. But it's not the first time that we've heard that. When I was a member of the state legislature, I initiated a program creating the Hudson River Valley Greenway, which is a multi-county project that stretches all along the Hudson River, uh, all along its tidal length, at least, as far north as the federal dam at Troy, about 150 miles. In that particular context, people raised the specter of government control. Of course, it wasn't true. and. Uh, that program has survived, and uh, people understand that. Even in the context of the designation of the Hudson River as an American heritage area last year, which came through this committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, <coughs> for which uh, uh, I and the people that I represent are, are very grateful for the fact that uh, the Hudson River was designated an American heritage area, along with uh, a number of other areas around the country. I think that that was a marvelous, very strong step forward in celebration of the great heritage of this country and uh, providing an opportunity for people to become better acquainted with, uh, with the uh, American heritage. This program, I think, is a great one. I have seen in the course of my, my tenure in public service an enormous improvement in America's rivers as a result of the Clean Water Program and the Safe Drinking Water Act. The quality of America's rivers have improved enormously. Unfortunately, in the 1980s, the Clean Water Act uh, funding was changed and, as a consequence, uh, cut back rather sharply. And so the progress that was made in earlier years has been slowed down. And the kind of things that Mrs. Chenoweth talked about just a few moments ago uh, are the result of that. If we had continued to fund the Clean Water Program at the rate that uh, it was originally envisioned and which was supported by early administrations, we would have rivers today that, uh, although they are a lot cleaner than they were, would, in fact, be even cleaner than they are. So we need to go back to that program and uh, reassess it. I hope that this Congress will address itself to that issue and that uh, we will, we will uh, adequately fund those programs. The gentleman signaling me for... No, I, I just want to know if the gentleman would yield for a moment yes, when please. he's done. I just want to uh, 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 say that uh, 
the, the, Ameri the, the Heritage Corridor area that we, uh, that, uh, you spoke of that we dealt with last session is interesting because it started out much the same way with the, an awful lot of opposition from people, but when we started to run out of time in the, in the session, uh, there was no end to members that wanted to make sure that their local communities, in fact, received that designation. In this session, we now have one of the strongest opponents of that legislation seeking extra legislative measures by which to get an area included that he fought so hard last year to get excluded. And so I think when people start to understand that the nomination process here, process and the work that local communities go in to get this designation, uh, ten, t I, I think we'll find that Ten Rivers will be a limitation given the, uh, the interest of local communities and members of Congress. Well, I thank the gentleman for that uh, observation. I think it's very important. My time is almost over. I'll just end by again saying uh, to the representatives of the administration here, my thanks to the administration, my thanks to the president for this uh, initiative. I think it's an extraordinarily positive and powerful one, and I hope that the Congress will address itself to it. There will be no impediments to its inaction because I think <coughs> the American people want this project and they want it badly. The lady from Washington, Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I've had a different experience. My phones have been ringing off the hook in my district offices from all over the state of Washington with people very concerned who happen to live along the Columbia River. Uh, they have watched several federal initiatives take their property. One host section cannot use their property even though these people have paid taxes for years. They can't even paint their own homes the color that would be their choice because it is within so many miles, not even visible, of the river. It has gone so far, they're wondering what this next federal intervention will be because you see, when the federal government does it, it starts losing reasonableness, the common sense of the people who also love the river, live on the river, rely on the river for their families to be able to eat. This is the area that I come from. We have a little problem with those from other states and around the nation saying that they have to move in the federal government to take care of our beautiful state. We have cooperative agreements with other states of Idaho and Oregon. We care deeply. This is our state. My grandchildren fish on the river. We boat on the river. Most of my family relies on the river. No, we not only don't not share the values of the president, we share the values. Where we differ is this. Do we believe that we care more than the president for where we live? Does he really believe that we are so irresponsible, we who live in those two states, that he has to bring in 12 federal agencies? And I guess this is the question I'm going to be looking to to have answered today. If this program is indeed voluntary, as it says, non-regulatory, <coughs> community-defined, and honorary, why do we need the federal government, in fact, 12 federal agencies, involved in this? We really love our state. We care for our environment. Our family plans on living there for many years. And I just can't believe that the president who lives here cares more about it than we do. So I'll be looking for that answer during the testimony and looking forward to reassuring the folks in my state that they're not going to just see the big hand of government from the East Coast come again, tap them on the shoulder and say, we certainly know best. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. I have no statement, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We have two members of Congress who are with us who we would like to hear from. Mr. McHale from Pennsylvania. We'll turn the time to you and then to uh, Doc Hastings from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished members of the committee, I am honored and pleased to be here this morning. I will have a formal statement for the record, but if I may, in the next five minutes, I'd like to simply summarize my testimony. Although my testimony is going to focus on one river, the Lehigh River, I think in many ways the story of the Lehigh is the story of our nation's rivers. My purpose in appearing before the committee today is to warmly and enthusiastically endorse the American Heritage Rivers Initiative. The distinguished author Norman McLean once wrote, eventually all things merge into one and a river runs through it. That phrase describes not only a wonderful book, it also describes my congressional district, a region of eastern Pennsylvania shaped socially, economically, and environmentally by the Lehigh River. 
A good friend of mine, Dennis Shaw, once wrote the following description of the Lehigh, quote, with its headwaters in the Pocono Plateau, the Lehigh River drains an area of approximately 1,364 square miles, containing parts of present-day Berks, Bucks, Carbon, Lackawanna, Lehigh, Luzerne, Monroe, Northampton, Pike, and Schuylkill counties. The river flows south and east for 75 miles before joining the Delaware at the forks of the Delaware in eastern Pennsylvania. More than one million citizens live and work within the Lehigh watershed. Mr. Chairman, my commitment to the protection and the restoration of the Lehigh River is not based on an abstract study of history. Within the past month, I have canoed the Lehigh's rapids, fished its waters, camped on its banks, and hiked more than 10 miles along its shores. I have lived within a mile of the Lehigh River my entire life. We are a community defined both literally and symbolically by the Lehigh River. The Act of Assembly, the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, dated March 6, 1812, defined Lehigh County as follows, that and all that part of Northampton County being within the limits beginning at the Bethlehem Line where it joins the Lehigh River, thence along said line until it intersects the road leading from Bethlehem to the Lehigh Water Gap. Literally, the county where I live is defined by the Lehigh River. Modern history along the Lehigh reflects a checkered past, including long periods of short-sighted greed, unsustainable consumption, and environmental abuse. Mr. Chairman, today in my brief testimony, I'm not going to give you a complete environmental or social history of the Lehigh River, but just let me point out a couple of critical dates. In 1740, David Nitchman was the first European to come and settle in our community. At that time, the, the area where I now live was described as follows, quote, it was wild and a forest at a distance of 50 miles from the nearest town and only two houses occupied by white people. No other dwellings were to be seen in the whole country except the scattered huts or wigwams of Indians. Here they commenced a settlement, Bethlehem. That's my hometown. That's where I live today. That's not some federal abstraction. That's the community in which I'm raising my children. On May 6, 1772, a record catch of 5,300 shad were harvested in the Lehigh River, about a half mile from where I live today. But in 1829, we turned a corner. It was a year of decision, in some ways positive, in some ways quite negative. John James Audubon, the distinguished naturalist and artist, spent six weeks in the upper Lehigh, painting and studying that portion of the river. But in that same year, the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company constructed a dam at the forks of the Lehigh where it flows into the Delaware River, permanently impeding the flow of shad in their annual migration up the Lehigh. By 1872, when coal had been discovered in northeastern Pennsylvania, a thousand canal boats traveled the canal parallel to the Lehigh River, transporting that coal to Philadelphia and New York. And there were consequences from that. By 1953, there were no shad caught in the Delaware. By 1968, the pollution block in Philadelphia meant that the shad could not spawn as they had historically spawned up the Delaware. By 1970, we again turned a corner with the passage of the Clean Streams Act. In that year, the pollution of the Lehigh had become so bad that an entire five-mile stretch of the river would not sustain aquatic life. I remember what that was like 25 years ago. I witnessed a river that had become an open sewer. In the past two decades, we have seen a river restored. Having spent 200 years destroying the natural beauty, the water quality, and the aquatic life of the Lehigh River, our community has recently dedicated itself to a more worthy goal, 40 years of river restoration. Where do we go from here? The Lehigh River is now part of a national heritage corridor with modest annual funding through the Department of the Interior. There is a management action plan that was approved in 1994 and I strongly support the continuing efforts in the private sector as well as the public sector to restore this great river. All of the existing public and private efforts to protect and restore the Lehigh River will be dramatically reinforced by the American Heritage Rivers Initiative. Mr. Chairman, if I may, with your indulgence, have one more minute. I believe that this program is the single most important conservation effort proposed to date by the Clinton administration. The more efficient and effective delivery of existing federal services and expertise, the sharing of river restoration experience, and the availability of river-related data via the internet and a well-planned website 
will prove to be a tremendous aid in the environmental protection, recreational improvement, and economic development of the Lehigh River. The American Heritage Rivers Initiative is in the conservation tradition of Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and Rachel Carson. It deserves the support and the funding of Congress. And finally, Mr. Chairman, we who live, work, and are raising our families along the Lehigh recognize that there is a reason why our region has become known worldwide as the Lehigh Valley. In the words of Norman McLean, a river runs through it. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to appear. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentleman from uh, Washington, Mr. Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the courtesy that the committee has given me to, uh, to sit here. Uh, I want to just mention a, a couple of things real briefly. Um, I live, uh, of course, uh, in an area where the Columbia River flows through. And uh, specifically in the Tri-City area, we uh, would like to enhance our, uh, our river shore there. And there was a consultant that came through and suggested very uh, strongly that perhaps the local community uh, look at the, uh, the Heritage River uh, initiative that is being proposed. Uh, I uh, sent a letter to them and said, well, we don't know really what's in there before you pursue this. Maybe you ought to, uh, you ought to uh, look and see what, what it's all about. I just received uh, letters back from one of the uh, commissioners, uh, actually signed by all the commissioners in one of the counties that's impacted, Benton County. And uh, if I may quote one uh, sentence here, they say this, quote, much of this activity regarding the uh, American, River, uh, American River Heritage Initiative, much of this activity has taken place with very little public information or understanding about the initiative or its potential ramifications, which I think is true. There's another local organization that's looking into this because there's a suggestion has been made that tourism will increase. Uh, we have a Tri-Cities Visitor and Convention Bureau that's been very active for 25 years in this area. And they sent me a letter and, and uh, they just make this statement, and I'll quote. Uh, quote, the information we have received has made us less inclined to pursue the President's initiative. Now, the reason I mention this, uh, and this kind of reflects the comments that I've heard certainly on this side of the aisle, uh, as, we go down, uh, as we go down this path, is that the, the question that at least the local people have, in my view, and I'd like to know if, uh, certainly listening uh, to the testimony to see if this can be answered, is the unintended, unintended consequences that happen because we have legislation that is supposedly warm and fuzzy and nice for local areas, but as we go down the line, uh, something, uh, something changes. And I just may add, with my friend from Pennsylvania and his testimony, clearly from his perspective, this is a conservation uh, initiative, clearly from his perspective. Uh, I can tell you uh, from the West, if that is the main initiative, then I have some great doubts uh, that this ought to be a conservation initiative. Uh, so clearly uh, we don't understand uh, where, where the administration is going on this. I would certainly like to see that clarified. So uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the, again for the courtesy, uh, and I look forward to the testimony that will be forthcoming. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Cannon, my colleague from the 3rd District. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like many of my colleagues, I also have considerable concerns about the uh, real import of the American, River, Rivers, uh, Her American Heritage Rivers Initiative. Uh, American <coughs> Americans today, unfortunately, do not place a great deal of trust in the federal government. Much of their uh, cynicism is fueled, unfortunately, by experience. Uh, for instance, last fall, this administration, in order uh, to pick up a few votes in California, disregarded the law, the Utah congressional delegation, and the people of Utah in secretly crafting a massive 1.7 million acre national monument in southern Utah, entirely within my district. <clears throat> All of this was done in the dark and without any public input. No wonder my constituents are cynical about this latest proposal by the administration. This proposal is built on the premise of trust us. But we in Utah know the, uh, about federal agencies and their false assurances and empty promises. My fear, and that of my constituents, is that this program is nothing more than a thinly veiled attempt by the federal government to grab more regulatory power. This hollow program offers no new money for real solutions for these communities. Instead, the initiative, as proposed by CEQ, would give participating communities $100,000 to hire a government bureaucrat. For what purpose? To help clean up rivers? No. To help restore historic landmarks or landscapes? No. In fact, these bureaucrats, so-called river navigators, have one primary purpose slopping at the federal trough for possible taxpayer funds. America's rivers and associated communities do not or do need improvements. 
but the solutions will come from our communities, from our people, and not from river navigator types. This initiative offers our towns and cities no real answers, no real plan. That is why the American Rivers Initiative and the River Navigators should be sent on the appropriate course downstream. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Hawaii, Mr. Abercrombie. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, do you suppose we might take advantage of the fact that Mr. McHale is here and perhaps question him in as much as he just testified? Is that in order? Uh, excuse me. As opposed to making statements at the moment? Uh, would you repeat your question? I said, do you suppose we might take advantage of the oh, fact that Mr. McHale is here testifying? Well, you Can I direct my Mr. questions McHale to him? Mr. McHale has already given his testimony, but you have five minutes. If Thank you. If you would like to uh, have an interchange with Mr. McHale, by Thank all means, use your time. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. McHale. Good morning, Neil. How are you? Very fine. Thank you. Um, in your uh, uh, statement, um, I missed the first part of it, and uh, you may have covered it, but I want to refer to something that Mr. Hansen and I believe others have, uh, have commented on uh, and to, to get your reaction. Um, obviously, you're in favor of, of uh, uh, carrying forward with this initiative. Now, taking into account that, uh, uh, or accepting for conversation's sake, that this may not have, have gone through all of the uh, uh, examination and analysis that would be required, and that the uh, committee's um, uh, hearing today and possibly subsequently uh, subsequent hearings is, is entirely in order, uh, in order to, to uh, accomplish the uh, legislative goals. Is it your contention that this is something that we should fund in addition to whatever funding may already be uh, uh, associated uh, with various departments, whether it's the Council on Environmental Quality or the Department of the Interior or the Forest Service subdivisions within it? The reason I ask the question is, as Mr. Hansen has pointed out, that if, uh, in a, if I understand it correctly, now there will be reprogramming of already authorized and, uh, and appropriated funds. And I, I don't think that's a good idea necessarily, or I think it's certainly something that should be examined. I think uh, uh, Chairman Hansen's pointed that out. So if, for conversation's sake, if we accept uh, the, the idea that the Heritage uh, Rivers is a good idea, is it your contention that we should uh, authorize and appropriate new funds to do that, uh, or is the reprogramming something you would accept at this stage? My study of the program would indicate that the vast majority of the funding can be reprogrammed. What we're talking about here is not the creation of a new bureaucracy or the creation of new statutory authority. We're talking about the more efficient administration and delivery of existing federal programs. For that reason, I think that existing funding would, for the most part, be satisfactory. But I, as an individual member of Congress, would vote for additional funding as necessary to supplement the existing funding, though I suspect that amount of funding would be, be very modest. I would simply say to Mrs. Chenoweth and, and other friends and colleagues who are skeptical about this program, I strongly support your belief that this program should never be imposed upon you. I think you deserve credit that there is an extended period of comment on this program. Once we complete that analysis, however, for those parts of the country, such as my own, that would very much at the local level like to participate in this program, so long as we adequately protect you from any imposition of the program, why not allow us to participate? Our rivers in the Northeast have experienced, for the most part, a degradation that, fortunately, has never been inflicted upon the rivers of the Northwest. We have a major challenge ahead of us in restoring those rivers, and this program can be a very significant aid in that process. Uh, Mr. McHale, I'd like to follow up on that point. Um, uh, while there may be some... Uh, uh, trepidation on some of the members' parts with respect to the implementation of this program, um, is, isn't it the case, or would it not be the case in many instances, that, that absent federal assistance, local resources might not be sufficient to be able to handle uh, the, uh, the, the difficulties that might be encountered in trying to do a comprehensive uh, a, a regional um, uh, uh, comprehensive regional considerations that might come up with respect to, to uh, restoration, et cetera. That's absolutely correct. We have a 75-mile stretch of river along which a million people live. That's 
nearly equal to the population of most of the states that are represented before me. We have a large concentration of population along a stretch of river that has received heavy industrial use over the last 100 years. We have three major cities, Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton, that are attempting to coordinate that restoration and revitalization effort. All we want is advice from the federal government. We That's want those who will come in with that expertise and at our request and to the degree that we solicit, step into our community and assist us in a partnership that will ultimately clean up, restore, and economically develop a river the like of which simply doesn't exist, for instance, in the state of Idaho, a magnificent state where I'm about to travel in two weeks and where I've spent a great deal of time. The rivers of Idaho are very different from the rivers of Pennsylvania. We have silt. We have mine drainage. We have had a century of pollution where we're making major strides to clean up that pollution, but clearly in that process, the federal government can be a partner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I recognize a gentleman from Tennessee who uh, did not use his time before for a question to the other gentleman. I just have one question, Paul. Do you have any objections to or problems with the Congress voting on this before it's done, rather than doing it by executive order without the Congress voting on it? Jimmy, I want to protect our rivers, and I want to do it in a way that encourages debate, encourages congressional participation. Certainly in terms of funding, Mrs. Chenoweth is correct. We hold the power of the purse, and I think that gives us an adequate safeguard on the substance of the legislation. But I have to smile. We heard references earlier from Mr. Cannon and some other folks about a president taking unilateral action. The President of the United States, acting without the consent of Congress, and in fact deliberately attempting to circumvent the will of some members of Congress, took executive action to protect the natural resources of the United States. I'm not referring to Bill Clinton. I'm referring to Teddy Roosevelt. Read his autobiography. What is objected to today is precisely what Roosevelt did nearly a century ago. And with the wisdom of hindsight and history, we now recognize that Roosevelt, fortunately, protected the natural resources of our nation so that we of this generation might be able to enjoy them. Thank you. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Peterson. I have no comments at this time. Uh, gentleman uh, from North Carolina, Mr. Joe. Gentleman from uh, Puerto Rico, Shalom uh, No, no questions. Thank you. No comments. Uh, thank you. I guess that covers you. Uh, Just one question. Uh, if we may, we'll recognize the gentleman from California, the gentleman from Washington, and then I, let's get on with the witnesses. Could we please, the gentleman from California? I, well, my, my assumption, Mr. Chairman, was that, that uh, Paul is a, is a witness here. Uh, is, that, is he? Yeah. So we, we can ask him questions, right? I mean, he's, he's a witness. L let me just ask you, the, the, the way you frame this bill and the, and the way I understand it, let me understand, uh, see if, if we're clear on this. My understanding is that, that local communities uh, at some point got to make a decision to nominate uh, River for participation. Not only must they nominate, but in evaluating those applications, the level of local public support is the decisive factor in determining whether or not an individual ri river will be so designated as an American Heritage River. For instance, in our case, the Republican mayor of Allentown, who watched the State of the Union address, came to me immediately after that address and said, Paul, this is a wonderful opportunity for the Lehigh River. We're attempting to develop an entire management plan for that watershed. Could you please do what you can to intervene with the federal government so that we at the local level, by nominating our river, can have it be designated as one of the first ten? I really don't think, and I appreciate the sensitivity and respect it, I really don't think that the issue will be the imposition of this status on any local community. I frankly think you're going to see enormous competition among all of the potential rivers to be designated for those ten that will actually be chosen. I don't think anyone will have this designation forced upon them. And as I see the, 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 the record developing, it starts to appear that you're essentially almost going to have to have a consensus yes. in, the, in the local community. From what I have read, and of course the administration witnesses can amplify this, I can't imagine that a river would be chosen for this program over the objection of the local member of Congress. Well, maybe we should give the local member of Congress a veto and we'll find out how strong they are. Uh, I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a great idea. I think you get, uh, I, I believe Mrs. Chenoweth just wrote that down. I think, uh, <laughs> but let me, uh, uh, 
you know, this, the, we, we've kind of been here before. I mean, we, we have scenic highways and we have heritage highways and we have now heritage corridors. And we have a lot of early opposition to these things. And then, you know, hindsight, people in communities decide they made the, the right decision. I remember being up in the Rocky Mountain National Park out on the back side of it. They have a scenic, uh, scenic highway designation that was hard fought coming up uh, one, of, one of the rivers there. And an old fellow got up and he owned the bar out there. And he fought this. He led the local organization. He put up all the window signs. He organized the ranchers, said that this was a federal land grab and so forth. And, uh, but it was a fact of life now a couple years later. And they, uh, when we were in this meeting out there trying to work out uh, who was going to feed the, uh, the wildlife from the national park, the farmers or the federal government, uh, somebody asked him what he, what he thought now about that scenic corridor, that scenic highway, and what was the best thing about it. He said the best thing about it was it puts butts in his bar stool on the bar that he runs. Mm. And the fact of the matter is what local communities have found out if they do comprehensive planning, organization, promotion, that many of these assets become huge economic engines uh, for activity and, 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 and for, uh, for income uh, for these communities and these designations. I think you're right. I think there's going to be a, a serious competition. Uh, to try to get in under the wire of, uh, of 10. And I also think that those of us who have lived on rivers and watched all the disjointed decisions by all of the federal agencies, all the lack of communication between the agencies, and it would be wonderful to have a navigator. I'm just going through a base closing. I went through one before. We didn't have any help from the administration. This administration, we have a navigator for that base closing. You know what? Every time the city and the county and, and local agencies have a problem, they go to that fellow from the Navy. He works it out with the Fish and Wildlife Service. He works it out with the state of California. And we're so far ahead of schedule, it's making our head spin. I mean, that's the difference in how you can approach this. We see it in brownfields. We see it in all kinds of approaches where communities have been left to fend for themselves. And now somebody comes along and offers help, and somebody wants to act like it's, it's some grand conspiracy. Fine. Opt out. But I think you're going to find the communities are going to want to opt into this. We're, going to, we're asking for a half a billion dollars to restore the river that runs by my congressional district because of a lot of individual disjointed decisions that have been made in the past, and nobody thought about the comprehensive impact, and now we've got an ecological disaster. In terms Thank of the you, relation, Paul, very much. For Thank you. The gentlelady from uh, Washington will be our last question, and then we're going to go to our witnesses. The gentlelady from Washington is recognized for one minute. Thank you. I think as I listened to this discussion and as I was listening to you, you, you said it is okay because we looked at history for the president or other authorities to step outside the balance of power of the Constitution, which I call breaking the law. Um, I guess as a budget person, that's my background, both at the state and corporately. If I take this amount of staff, and I've got the document of the staffing, and I take it out of other areas and I put it to a new area, I'm stating they're overstaffed. The other areas are overstaffed. Now, this administration testified they needed more people in these areas. So what they're saying now is we are going to take them out of other areas to start this new program. Therefore, the president has decided to replace Congress in the Constitution. That is not okay. Do you believe these other programs are overfunded enough to transfer all this staff? Or are you really saying, and this, is, this was a little bit disturbing as a colleague, that we can step aside as a Congress and say yes, whether it be a Republican or Democrat president, that they can start a new program, authorize it, knowing full well that they are violating the separation of powers where Congress is supposed to authorize. So we protect the people at home from one person having all the power. I very rarely hear another official say, it is okay in history, therefore it's okay now to violate the Constitution. So I guess I'm gonna have to ask you as a colleague, what other programs and areas do you believe that the president should be able to step out and say, I'm going to start a program without a vote of Congress because we might be setting a precedent here that there will be others coming and saying, we don't need a Congress, then you might not have to run again. Mrs. Smith, I have taken an oath to the Constitution of the United States as a member of the state legislature, a member of Congress, and as a United States Marine on more than a dozen occasions throughout my lifetime. And, and I have to say that, respectfully, your paraphrase of my testimony was wholly inaccurate. 
We have the power of the purse under Article I of the Constitution. No chief executive, Bill Clinton or anyone else, should have unilateral power. We have considerable authority through the appropriations process to approve or disapprove action taken by a president of the United States. I was simply pointing out with historic accuracy that in the autobiography of Teddy Roosevelt, the kind of action that has been undertaken by President Clinton and has been criticized in this committee room today was precisely the same action that Teddy Roosevelt undertook and about which he wrote with pride. A hundred years later, if Roosevelt had not taken that action, almost a, a century later, we would not enjoy the forests of the Northwest that were protected from greed and extravagance and consumption uh, but for Teddy Roosevelt's intervention. We have enormous power under the Constitution. I praise Mrs. Chenoweth, although I would never vote for her bill. It is constitutionally proper in that she seeks to terminate funding in the exercise of our authority under Article I of the Constitution. I believe the President, you may disagree with his decision, I believe that the President can exercise authority under Article II that allows him to create this program. We then decide under Article I whether we're willing to pay for it. Mr. Chairman. Then I guess the answer you have is this should not go forward unless Congress votes for it. And I think for the money the for it. I yes. wanted to get to that he has authorized a new program. He does not have the money by his own testimony and those that are coming before us because they've said they don't have enough money in their programs. Therefore, this cannot go forward constitutionally. As you said, you took an oath to the Constitution without a vote of Congress. And I guess that's the point I want to make. We can vote here, but should we only need one person, the Founding Fathers would have chosen a king. Therefore, I'm going to be objecting unless we debate this and we all decide to, deci to start this new program or not in the Congress. And that's probably the, the most important thing that we address today. I sure appreciate your support of the rivers. I also support the rivers, but I also support the Constitution and don't believe we should step aside for it just because it's convenient for the moment or because historically someone else did it. Thank you. We appreciate uh, Mr. McHale coming before us and our good friend from Pennsylvania and uh, uh, the Mr. Chairman, you thank made. You. Uh, we'll go to our witnesses. I, I'm going to editorialize for 30 seconds. And that is uh, my good friend from Pennsylvania. Uh, I too have great feelings about Teddy Roosevelt, one of my heroes in life. Uh, the 1906 antiquity law However, we now have a, the uh, Park Bill in 1915 and 1969 NEPA, the 1964 Wilderness and 1976 FLIPMA, which in my opinion give tr a thousand times more protection than what pr President Roosevelt did, even though I think he was right in what he did and I applaud his actions. I think we have much better laws now to protect. In fact, if anything, 1906 antiquity law takes away protection as we've seen in southern Utah. Uh, with that, we'll excuse you and ask our next uh, panel to come up. We're very honored to have with us uh, our two secretaries, the Honorable Bruce Babbitt, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Interior, the Honorable Dan Glickman, our former colleague, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We're honored to have Kathleen McGinty, Chairman of the Council of Environmental Equality. And we appreciate our three witnesses being with us. Dan Glickman. Uh, who is probably the most articulate person on tort reform on light aircraft I've ever met in my life. And uh, we're very Mr. grateful Chairman. for all three of them. Uh, Chairman. Uh, gentleman from Hawaii, briefly. Yes, just uh, before we begin, I w want to indicate that Mr. Babbitt has a conflict of interest here because he's indicated to me on many occasions he'd like to come out and search for rivers out in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kathleen McGinty, we'll start with you, okay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today on the very important American Heritage Rivers initiative. Mr. Chairman, this initiative represents a historic opportunity to support efforts to revitalize the communities that surround three and a half million miles of rivers and streams that flow throughout our nation. American Heritage Rivers focuses on the powerful link between healthy rivers and healthy communities. As prescribed and called for by the National Environmental Policy Act, this initiative is built on the fact that environmental, cultural, and economic goals are inextricably linked and that citizens' voices have to be central to federal action. Why rivers? 
Because, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, as Mayor Richard Reardon said of the Los Angeles River, rivers often represent the heart of our city or a community's spirit. Rivers with their beauty, their history, their lure, their economic force provide a centerpiece, an organizing principle around which disparate elements of a community can come together to work toward the economic, cultural, and environmental revitalization of their place, their home. Mr. Chairman, I've had the privilege and opportunity of seeing this happen in every part of our country. My own hometown is Philadelphia. Twenty years ago, the Delaware waterfront was no place you want it to be. Crime and drugs, trash and decay. But as the bicentennial of our nation approached, that river captured the imagination of Philadelphians. It had a story to tell, we realized. Penn's Landing, George Washington's Crossing, it was part of what made our city and indeed our country great. Philadelphians were determined to take that waterfront back, push the pushers out, revitalize the historic buildings. Revitalizing that waterfront then compelled ideas to take back Front Street, Second Street, Third Street, with the result that all of downtown Philadelphia, now 20 years later, is thriving and whole and very much alive. Chattanooga, Tennessee. In 1969, Chattanooga was voted America's dirtiest city. Today, Chattanooga is hailed as a miracle city, as one of America's most livable. And where did it all start? With the inspiration of a high school student who said, hey, the Tennessee River is a pretty unique and wonderful resource. Why don't we celebrate it by putting a first of its kind freshwater aquarium on its banks? Chattanooga did. And now that aquarium, and indeed the entire city, is world-renowned. St. Paul, Minnesota. I just visited there with Mayor Norm Coleman and some 20 other mayors of the Upper Mississippi, Republicans and Democrats alike, who gathered because of their tre tremendous enthusiasm for this initiative. Mayor Coleman has taken to calling St. Paul, St. Paul on the Mississippi and will tell you in no uncertain terms that reconnecting that city with its wonderful river was the single most important factor that enabled him just recently to convince a major software manufacturer to locate in the heart of the city, bringing jobs back into that city. The river restored makes that city an attractive, exciting, unique, and extremely compelling place to be. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer some declarative statements on what this initiative is and what it is not. It is 100% voluntary. Communities don't have to participate, and once participating, can opt out at any time. It is 100% locally driven. This is purely bottom up. Whether, whether to participate and the plan for participation are completely under the control and in the hands of local citizens. It is 100% non-regulatory. There are absolutely no new regulatory requirements or restrictions of any kind that will come as part of this program. It is 100% in compliance with and indeed compelled by the National Environmental Policy Act. Through this initiative, environmental, economic, and social concerns are finally being integrated and brought into one coherent whole in a way that is designed and driven by local communities. It is also 100% directed by the President and Vice President's effort to reinvent government. The initiative is a directive to federal agencies better to serve the citizens that they meet, to do more with less, to cut red tape and bureaucracy, so citizens can access resources that they pay for in an efficient and effective way. What this initiative is not, it is not an attempt by federal agencies to take on new authorities and responsibilities. 
Rather, it is an effort to execute current authorities as those agencies are already directed to do that is in a coherent and coordinated way, in a way that most responsibly expends taxpayers' dollars, in a way that most efficiently and effectively serves the citizens of this country. It is not an attempt to take anyone's private property. Private property rights will in no way be adversely affected through this effort to dispel any notion to the contrary. Language on protecting private property rights penned by President Reagan will be included in the final program. Finally, this initiative is not a program of the United Nations. No foreign government or governmental entities are involved in any way, either directly or as some have been concerned by way of deploying surveillance systems of some kind. There is just no such thing of any such kind involved in this initiative. Mr. Chairman, we have consulted far and wide on this initiative. This has been a very open and public process. First, of course, the President announced it in the State of the Union so that all could be aware. Secondly, we immediately established a home page and a hotline on this initiative, and we've received 31,000 hits to that home page. Third, we've held more than a dozen meetings in every region of the country where hundreds of people representing every walk of life, business, agriculture, arts and education, federal, state, local governments, environmental concerns all participated. Fourth, we have sent senior administration officials to every meeting we have been invited to by others on this initiative. Mayors, members of Congress, the American Farm Bureau, property rights groups, the Western States Coalition to discuss this program and there have been at least 10 such meetings, Texas, Washington State, Iowa, Missouri, etc. Fifth, we published a Federal Reg Register notice seeking comment on every aspect of this program, and we've now extended the comment period, so now that we, we will have received more than 90 days of comment on the program. Sixth and finally, we have had at least 14 meetings on this program on Capitol Hill. Mr. Chairman, this is a positive initiative. It is based on principles this Congress and this committee have espoused. It is locally driven. It cuts bureaucracy and red tape. It brings economic and social concerns into environmental decisions. Purely and simply, it is government at the service of citizens. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Secretary Babbitt will turn the time to you, sir. Chairman, committee members, I appreciate the chance to come back and appear before this committee, and I'd like briefly uh, to uh, describe for you the roots of my involvement uh, in this program. It really began uh, back in 1995 when this Congress uh, was taking a wrecking ball to the environmental laws of this country. Uh, and I responded by leaving town for uh, considerable periods because I felt that it was really time to get out and reconnect with the American people and see what I could learn about how the environmental laws of this country uh, were being used. And I very quickly discovered that there was something new happening in this land. And you've already heard uh, from the Congressman and from Katie uh, about this phenomenon. Citizens all over this country are turning back to rediscover their heritage and their roots in the rivers that nourish their communities and that are entwined in the history of this country. Uh, I spent three days going up the Hudson River that summer in uh, the area described by Mr. Hinchy, and I saw a remarkable renaissance in communities like Poughkeepsie and Troy Peekskill, where those waterfronts are literally being revived. And what I heard from the citizens of those communities was that part of that grassroots success in Poughkeepsie was their ability to go to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, not in Washington, but at the local level, and to commandeer HUD resources and put them to use in their vision. Um, up in Troy, I heard from a community which has restored its waterfront about how they'd gone to the Environmental Protection Agency 
and brought those programs down and connected them with that river. Uh, I heard communities talking about the Corps of Engineers and how uh, the Corps had, at their request, uh, joined in these partnership efforts. I spent a summer day on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania, <coughs> floating down to Harrisburg and then further down, where I saw, uh, as the congressman intimated on the Lehigh River, a most extraordinary revival of that river. The shad runs are now proliferating up that river. And what the citizens <coughs> in those communities told me was that they had gone to the Fish and Wildlife Service and to the National Marine Fisheries Service, not in Washington but in their own communities in the state of Pennsylvania and said, you're the federal government, but you're here to serve us and we're going to show you what we need in this community. Uh, several months ago, actually in June of this very year, uh, I was out on the Cuyahoga River at the request of Congressman Regula. I had visited the Cuyahoga a year before because I wanted to go back to where the river burned and to see what had been happening out there in the last few years. And of course what I found where the river burned was, was a lake restored. And out on the Cuyahoga I saw an entire new riverfront development. I saw fishing boats out on the mouth of that river. Uh, I saw blue herons sweeping down across the river in search of a meal. Congressman Regula took me upstream, a hundred miles upstream, through a national recreation area, uh, beyond that into the headwaters of the Cuyahoga. And I listened and met with citizens who told me that as part of their effort to restore their river, they had gone to the National Park Service, to the Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Division of the service, and to the uh, Heritage and Historic uh, uh, preservation groups and brought them into the community and said, we want you to direct your efforts in aid of our vision. And it's happening. And the communities are driving it. And they came to this Congress last year and had their efforts uh, translated into legislation uh, in the form of a heritage conservation area. Two more examples, uh, because unlike the congressman from Pennsylvania, uh, I believe these are Western issues, and I want to tell you, as a Westerner, I believe that Western communities are as interested in this President's initiative as any initiative as any communities in the East. I was out in Seattle during the course of this summer at a place called Piper Creek, which runs through suburban Seattle where I saw an entire high school and its teachers with their kids out on Piper Creek saying, we believe we can restore the salmon running out of Puget Sound up Piper Creek into Seattle. And they took me out one summer day and they actually showed me that the salmon had returned for the first time within memory of anyone in Seattle. And I said, how did you do that? And they said, we went to the Environmental Protection Agency and got assistance at our request to clean up a wastewater treatment plant. And then we went downtown to the Fish and Wildlife Service and said, what do we need to do to get the salmon spawning in this stream? Lastly, I'd like to say just a word about the McKinsey River uh, in Oregon. This is a, a tributary of the Willamette River, which runs uh, uh, <coughs> right by Eugene and several other cities, uh, where there, the citizens have come together and formed what they call a watershed council. Uh, it has on it county commissioners, uh, representatives of the local utility companies, uh, educators, citizens, representatives from I think it's Weyerhaeuser, but at any rate, one of the uh, local forest products company. They've set out to restore that entire river. Uh, it's, a, it's a magical place when you see the steelhead and the salmon spawning up there, they're in danger of losing them. And they're out there restoring wetlands, uh, planting alders and, and poplars along the, along the banks of the river, working uh, with the county to put together a riparian protection plan. And I asked them, I said, uh, what can we do? And they said, Mrs. Smith, 
uh, they said, we don't need any programs, any new programs. What we need is access to existing resources. They said, we've gone to the Forest Service, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and they're helping us do this. And we've gone to the Bureau of Land Management, and they're helping us inventory the landscape around this river. And we got some help from the USGS. They're providing us hydrographic data sets and maps. And it was in that moment that I realized what this concept's about. It's not new programs. It's as Katie McGinty said to, it's empowering citizens to access existing programs that you have voted to help them, and we are reconnecting with their efforts. And that's, of course, the reason that the President, uh, in his State of the Union address, said, I'd like to showcase these examples, and I'd like to help local citizens get better access to these resources by coordinating their availability. And uh, it's in that spirit uh, that I come here, obviously, uh, simply to recite my experience and to say uh, I think this is a, uh, an important moment in which this Congress, by helping us with these programs, uh, can come to the aid of, of your constituents all over this country. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Secretary Dan Glickman, Secretary of Agriculture. Turn the time to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Jim. It's an honor to be here and to uh, serve with, be here and with so many people that I served with before. And I just make a couple comments. I, I hear a couple of things being said today. One is I hear from some folks about this distrust of the federal government. And, you know, I served 18 years in this body. I understand that. I, I would hear that from time to time myself. The other issue which uh, my colleagues have talked about is the issue of empowerment, which is there are communities in this country who do use the resources of that the taxpayers of this country pay every year to try to help themselves. And, and, and the goal is to try to find a way to give them the right to choose how to spend the money in the most effective way possible. So how do you blend those two things? And, and what we're trying to do is to take a program to focus existing federal resources on helping communities achieve their vision for a river's future. Not the government's vision, their vision. So existing resources, achieving their vision, empowerment. And in a way, actually, it, it reduces the kind of distrust there is of, of the federal government because it gives them the power. And let me tell you, I'm involved with an issue, the empowerment zones. Mo many of you in this room have experienced it. We have a couple in particular, one in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas and one in the Mississippi Delta, where what we have done is taken existing resources in very distressed poor areas and given to the communities the power and the authority to spend existing dollars, use existing laws to help them attract jobs, improve their environment, rebuild education systems where appropriate, taking the programs that were there that were rather hodgepodge and uncoordinated and saying to them, you decide how best to coordinate those programs. You talk with your representatives from the Mississippi Delta or South Texas and they'll tell you that for the first time we actually have those programs coming together in a rather meaningful way to see economic development occur. And in a sense, the American Heritage Rivers program is like an empowerment zone for rivers to get people the authority at the local level to spend those dollars and to coordinate those resources as much as possible. We call it a river navigator. I kind of call it a river facilitator uh, to, you know, to cut through the red tape and help obtain technical assistance and funding from existing federal programs. We provide that Natural Resources Conservation Service. Provides most of the technical assistance on private lands in this country. Stream bank, bank restoration, riparian restoration, those kinds of things. Working with landowners on a positive basis. Uh, Forest Service, other agencies do the same thing. This kind of what it does is provide one-stop shopping so that people can come to basically one place with the, with the mindset and the innovation at the local level and say, well, how best can we use these federal resources? And, you know, this is something we're trying to do at USDA generally. Uh, historically, we've had several shops out there in every county in America advising farmers and ranchers how to do certain things. And, and oftentimes, you would get conflicting advice. And so what we're trying to do at USDA service centers around the country is to, in fact, 
put in one office folks that serve farmers in rural communities so that the full range of federal help is there. In a sense, that's what we're trying to do here on the American Heritage River Festival. Uh, well, it's a festival if it works, I guess, but American, <laughs> American Heritage uh, Rivers uh, 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 Forum, the opportunity to do. We do that in our Urban Resources Partnership which is uh, done and, and many people in this uh, room and others have seen this program because it places resources directly in the hands of communities together to decide how best they can improve uh, uh, their areas in the urban parts of this country in terms of resources. It's the same kind of thing that we do here. So what USDA will do is use our Forest Service, our Natural Resources Conservation Service, our Extension Service, our Farm Service Agency, and uh, other parts of rural development to help with funds and technical know-how. We have agencies, as does uh, Secretary Babbitt, uh, known around the world for successfully disseminating the latest science-based technologies, information, land management practices to help landowners and communities utilize their resources in a responsible way. But it's the local communities that are going to decide basically what is the responsible way to use these. It's not the federal government. We have funds and technical assistance can help people to do that. I just want to repeat a few things before I, I stop. This program is not a new regulatory program. It will, we will continue to support voluntary community-led grassroots efforts. It is not an, an expensive program, new program. We can use existing funds to get this done, just using them in a more effective way, and it's not a new legal mandate. The initiative will operate within already existing programs and legal authority. No new authorizations are asked for or are needed. Last week, this Congress approved a bill, I believe it came out of this committee, if I'm not mistaken, the Quincy Library Group's pilot project. I was actually very much involved in that. I went out there to Quincy Library Group, talked with them two years ago, right after I came to this job, and they said to me, they had environmentalists, they had timber people, they had local community people, and they said, we'd like to come together to see what we can do locally to best manage our forest. And you all, working with them and working with a variety of groups, approved a bill, 429 to 1, I believe, which is a demonstration of how people with divergent groups, local communities, can draw down their, and lay down their proverbial swords and work together to develop a plan that opens and, and provides environmental and fire protection and keeps some timber mills open as well. Now, I guess what I'm saying is that's, the communities are very diverse out there. They're not of all one mindset. They're going to sit down together, try to develop consensus to get this done. We think this proposal has a great opportunity to empower local communities to use resources in a much more effective way than they're doing right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the testimony of the panel. Uh, I would, I'm going to recognize the members in the order they came in from side, uh, um, majority to minority. And I would appreciate it very much if you would stay within your time. Uh, Mr. Miller. Well, th <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I just want to commend you for your for your testimony uh, and for the process that you have undertaken. And thank you for extending the comment period, but for the process that you have undertaken uh, on behalf of this initiative. Uh, you know, again, the suggestion has been made that somehow this is a surprise. That this is, uh, you know, I guess if you weren't listening to the State of the Union, but that somehow this has snuck up on everybody. And I look at. Uh, the list of organizations, the national organizations that you have notified from the, the forest products people, the pulp, uh, the pulp people, all of the different states, states river basins, the, uh, uh, the Governor's Association, the National Rifle Association, the sporting good manufacturers, the tribal councils uh, of all of the various states and regions and, and their organizations, local uh, regulatory agencies, the Planning Association, uh, towns and townships, uh, various educational, environmental organizations, uh, 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 various nonprofit organizations, all of the water interest, uh, the petroleum industry, the refiners association, the, 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 you know, the people that basically have grown up around the river communities. Uh, we've all used these rivers at different times for different purposes. And a lot of communities are now rethinking uh, what's the future of their river and what, uh, what can be restored and, and uh, and how do and and uh, uh, as, as communities have changed, what uh, what additional values uh, can be brought to the river? How have values changed in the communities from uh, the way the rivers uh, uh, were used in the past? And and I just think that again that this is this is a very very welcome initiative. Uh, 
uh, you know, good portions of our nations are going through this kind of rethinking as they're trying to build livable communities, as they're trying to get on that list of good places to retire, good places to live, a place to take a, a vacation. If you, if, you look, if you walk by the newspapers, uh, the magazine racks in, in an airport, the lists are out because it's the beginning of summer. Where to spend your money, where to take a vacation, where to get away from it all, uh, where, where are you safe? And whether they're big urban cities on big rivers, or whether they're small towns looking to see how they can change from one economy to another, they want to engage in this process. And I think mm -hmm. to have the federal government suggest that uh, 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 we're going to try to come in a cooperative manner rather than sitting back and waiting for you to come up with an idea, then we'll whack it around for a few months uh, and bounce it around and, and uh, tell you we'll get back to you later, that we'll get in on the ground floor is exciting. It's exciting. In fact, probably this initiative is as creative as it is for the federal government. It's probably a little bit behind what's going on in local communities, but brings some very added direction in terms of instructing these agencies to try and work together for the benefit of these communities. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, 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 if the resources of, of somebody or a position like the navigator can be created, uh, that's, that's a godsend when you're trying to do this kind of uh, kind of comprehensive uh, uh, planning. And I just think that the fact that, uh, again, we have two, <laughs> two of the lead agencies, departments uh, uh, right here in front of us that have an awful lot to say about the, uh, uh, the life cycle of these, of these rivers, from the headwaters to the, uh, to the oceans, uh, between interior and, and agriculture. Um, the, there's, there's an awful lot you can do to help communities. There's an awful lot you can do to, to you know, just sort of go along as business as usual. We'd prefer that you, uh, uh, that you try to help the communities. And, uh, you know, I guess there'll be an effort to knock this off the, the track. Some, you know, that, uh, that, that, that seems pretty clear. Uh, I only hope that, that, uh, uh, that members of Congress fully understand, uh, Ms. McGinney, as you've, as you've pointed out, uh, the, the voluntary nature of this, the, 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 the fact of the, uh, of the community seeking these resources, seeking this help, that that's the, that's the initiator. It's not the federal government coming in and directing them how to do this or not do this. But there's certainly uh, ample evidence that there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, in the various river communities uh, for a program of, uh, of, of, of rehabilitation in some instances or just recognizing the cultural and, uh, and, and, and history. Of these, uh, of these rivers. You know, we, I come from the San Francisco Bay Area and we're we come in through the, through the delta from the, uh, from the Sacramento San Joaquin rivers and one of them is dead and runs into the ground and the other is in a lot of trouble. Uh, but in the state we've obviously put a lot of value on these rivers in the last couple of years and with the help of the federal government, as I said, we're, we're talking about a half a billion dollars to try to go back and correct some of the mistakes that everybody now acknowledges were made. And I think if we would have had a process like this in the beginning where we could have thought about uh, uh, in a comprehensive way what, what some of the results might have been, uh, how much money we could have saved and, 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 and maybe some of the, uh, some of the parts of, of that river community that could have been preserved. We used to have a wonderful Italian fishing community, uh, commercial fishing industry that, uh, that just went by the wayside because we, we weren't smart enough about uh, the refineries and, and, and their impacts on the rivers. Today, we've cleaned up the river, but but uh, there's nobody left to fish them in terms of the, uh, in terms of the skills and the talent. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to be learned from this initiative. I would hope people would, uh, would give it very, very serious consideration, and I certainly applaud the, uh, the President and, uh, uh, for this and for the time and effort that the three of you have put into this to make it uh, a very, very user-friendly uh, 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 effort by the administration. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. The gentleman from Montana, Mr. Hill, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Coming from the state with the original river that runs through it, uh, Montana State great pride in, uh, in its rivers and, as a matter of fact, has taken uh, great strides in making sure that our rivers are protected. I think we have among the, the uh, most difficult, if you will, or the toughest water quality standards in the nation. Um, I, I just have a few questions about, and I guess I'd start by saying is that with all the success stories that you outlined, perhaps that would make the most compelling argument that you don't need this program rather than that you do need it. But um, I can certainly see that in many instances I think people believe that the, the myriad of bureaucracy that we have in the government makes it difficult to solve problems when people want to draw together to do that. 
Um, Katie, uh, you've held briefing sessions around the country on this program, as I recall. Is that, is that correct? Yes, we've had um, formal meetings in more than 12 places in every region of the country, yes. H have you done any briefing sessions at all in Montana with any groups on this issue? Um, I could get back to you on that. I don't know off the top of my head that one has been in Montana, but there certainly has been one in that region of the country. Um, if, if, I would appreciate if you would uh, make that information available sure. for the record. I'd also be curious about who got invited to those meetings and how the uh, the list of people that were was invited uh, was selected and that sort of thing so that we'd have that for the record that I, I wanted that if point, I could if that, I could just ask please. a few questions about this being a collaborative process because I'm a big proponent of of the collaborative method of dealing with I guess what you would say is a gridlock with regard to the conflict between economic and environmental uh, policy with regard to the country when you when you um, talk about um, seeking designation uh, would, would, for example, you insist on having the governor of the state's support uh, before you designate a river in a state, uh, a heritage river? Well, a central element of this program is that any applications that come forward, and again, they come forward from the grassroots, but needs to show broad-based support, and a central piece of that will be the support of elected officials. Okay, but would that the would governor's be support be, do you think, important? It, it would be of extreme importance. So if the governor was opposed, would you say that that would, uh, would automatically uh, suggest to you that you don't have broad-based public support? I would support? say that would be an extremely high hurdle for okay. <coughs> that particular How proposal. about local governments, county and city <coughs> governments? Would you be seeking the, the county and city governments? <coughs> would, would that be a necessary element? For, well, uh, at well least, again, uh, this largely. is, excuse me, again, this is bottom up, so we will be seeking no one on this, but if a, an application comes forward, we would very much expect to see, and the uh, Federal Register notice is very clear on this, letters of support or endorsements from a broad spectrum, including local uh, representative, uh, locally elected officials. So if, if local governments were opposed and a citizens group uh, wanted a listing, uh, in your judgment, would that rule out then a listing uh, designation? I think it would make it very difficult. That would be an extremely high hurdle for that particular uh, application. And, and the citizens group that we're talking about, the, this grassroots group, do you have in mind or do you intend to have in, uh, in the, the rules uh, that there be local government uh, officials represented on these, in these citizens groups in terms of uh, both seeking the designation and then if the designation is sought and in setting the goals and also uh, hiring, for example, the uh, coordinator and uh, mm -hmm. w would you see that local government people, in your view, would local government people have to be part of that process? It would be extremely important and that's noted in the, um, in the Federal Register again. I guess I'd note on that point as well that um, the Conference of Mayors, for example, has unanimously passed a resolution in support of this initiative. So we've been reaching out to make sure that local government entities are very well aware of this program. Really one last question. One of the things that I heard in your testimony was, and, and the Secretary Babbitt's testimony is, is, the, is the discussion about restoring the waterfronts and, and rivers that are in problems. Those of us in the West, of course, see the resource of water a little differently because we've protected our water. We look upon water and these rivers, of course, as potential for economic development, the use of the water and the use of the, of the water areas as opposed to restoring them. Are you, are you going to make a commitment here that you'll be working with those of us in the West where we want to see development of our water resources, um, that uh, this effort will, will be uh, an equal effort to helping us if our local communities want to develop those resources as opposed to just focusing on uh, restoring um, on environmental damage that's occurred in the past? Absolutely, and the central focus of this initiative is to show that integration between economic and historic and cultural factors with environment, what was typically uh, thought of only as an environmental issue, to show the interlinkages between economic and cultural social factors with environmental issues. Well, certainly I think we can all agree that the resource of the U.S. government can solve problems or compound them. And it's my hope that if you go forward to this program that it will be solving problems, not compounding them. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Gibbons. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I need some help in understanding some of the definitions that are in this uh, proposal. First of all, tell me exactly who would be included or what is included in the river community. Uh, is it just uh, a section of a river 
Or is it the whole river? What happens when there is a conflict between one party of one section of the river wanting this designation and someone else upstream, downstream, wherever it may be, not wanting this? What do you see as the river community? Who's going to compose that river community? Well, certainly not the federal government. Um, this, again, will not be a top-down command and control, one-size-fits-all. Well, I understand. Yeah, that's part of your up. testimony. Yes. On the local level, who's going to be in this river community? Uh, it will have to be a broad and diverse constituency of people who not only have an interest in, but live in, are connected to, are a part of that community. All right. Let me give you an example. For example, if I went to my colleague, Mr. Hill's state, mm -hmm. and went fishing on the Missouri River. I'm a user of that river. Am I now part of that river community because I use it as a recreationist or, or some other part of uh, that river exercise? Can I then say or petition the government as a user of that river to that, have it included? That's not at all what we would have in mind. What was um, the thought behind this is people who find that community and call that community their home. So you would say residents along the river would have the ability to choose whether or not that uh, river would be designated or people petitioned. Have, we, we would be looking for very strong and lasting connections to the area well, that uh, Fishing is a proposed. strong and lasting connection to me. Uh, so you're going to say that that is not a qualification, Well, though. and if you came to the table with an application that was supported by a broad spectrum of people who have lived there for 100 years or who have lived there okay. are going to call this a ho their home for 100 years, that would make a difference. So a special interest can't just walks, waltz into right. your community without right. local support and get it designated. Right. Great. Uh, how many river communities along a stretch of river do you envision? Again, that will depend on how many communities are interested in pursuing an application. Okay, now if we had the Missouri River, say we had 10 river communities seeking application for designation as American Heritage River, would we then have 10 river navigators for each one of those communities? Not necessarily. Uh, each of those river communities would have identified to them a river navigator. Now, whether or not that river navigator could serve more than one community, I think would have to be dependent upon the complexity of the issues that are being faced and the demand on the person. Technically, time. you're saying there could be. Uh, could be again, depending on the circumstances, but also could not be. Okay. The river navigator has the ability to evaluate local solutions to local problems. Does that evaluation include being able to change? Uh, the local community's uh, desires or their solutions to the environmental problems? No, the, the river navigator will have no decision-making uh, authority of that kind. Okay. Secretary Babbitt, you've thought about this uh, American Heritage River program for about seven months now, haven't you? Well, <coughs> well the Congressman, since I would say the beginning of 1995, actually. Okay, so two years. <coughs> little over two years now. Name for this committee the top ten rivers that you're going to recommend under the American Heritage River. Well, uh, in all modesty, Congressman, I don't think I'm going to make a recommendation. It's not my function. Well, uh, you've thought about it. You've sure. visioned them. You've talked about them. You've got some out there. Can't you tell this committee? Why won't you tell this committee? Why, well, what your the reason ten I can't tell this committee, committee, Congressman, is because uh, that's not the idea of this program. <laughs> the idea of the program uh, is to say to communities around the United States, if you're interested in this program, and if you have all of the stakeholders in your community interested, make your case. Well, there's some but, but, rivers uh, that... Don't you see that, you know, in my... I see your position, but I say there's some rivers that deserve a higher priority. Uh, well, but, the Hudson but, might have a higher priority than the Boise River in Idaho. Well, but, but in my... Testimony. The point that I made repeatedly was, what this really about is about is responding to local needs expressed compellingly by local people. And that's where it's got to come from. Okay. Now, I could point you to a lot of really interesting uh, river restoration issues. Uh, for example, in the West, uh, uh, if you were to go up to Henry's Fork in Idaho, you would see 
uh, a really remarkable group of people working together there. They're, they're all over the landscape. They're in every state. Uh, and it's a powerful grassroots movement, which I think involves uh, the very best of the American tradition. And the, the irony is that we have a Republican bench here voicing skepticism and outright opposition to a concept which you should be embracing because of its obvious and powerful orientation to empowering local communities. The time of the gentleman from Nevada has expired. As we're a little heavy on the Republican side, I'm going to take one more Republican, then we'll go back and forth. That's all right with everybody. That's what we have done in the past. Our staff tells me that, uh, that uh, we have two uh, folks here that are Good for information, we may want uh, Mr. Robert H. Wayland, Director of Office of Wetlands Office and Watershed Office of USDA Environmental Protection Agency. We've got two additional chairs on either end. Maybe we put these folks up. Uh, Mr. John <coughs> Zersky, Acting Assistant Secretary of Civil Works Department of the Army, Washington, D.C. Maybe we could ask those two folks to come up for additional uh, questions. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Crapel for five minutes and then. Uh, uh, the gentlelady from Virginia, uh, Virgin Islands, excuse me, for five minutes. Gentleman from uh, Crapel, uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, Mr. Babbitt, I would just say you're correct about the significant progress we've been making on the Henry's Fork in Idaho. The concerns that we have are that we've been able to do that without this initiative, and we're concerned, frankly, that perhaps this initiative would put the federal government in charge of the very process that has helped us make such good progress. And we want to make sure that it works right and is facilitated properly. And that's, why, that's the reason for a lot of these questions. And um, Ms. McGinney, I, I think I'll focus my questions on you to, because I believe you have the expertise and understanding of the development of this. And most of my questions are going to be somewhat technical just about how it operates. The first question is, who is in the, the uh, AHR federal interagency team? Who is that? Well, it would include representatives of the 13 different, uh, 12 or 13 different agencies who are uh, coming together to uh, be part of this initiative. If you'd like, I could read those off. No, I just wanted to, be, to understand it. The way I read the documents, it sounded like it was federal officials. Sorry, federal? It sounded like it was a group of federal officials representing the agencies. Exactly right. That's what the interagency team is, yes. And then I know that there have already been questions here about the river community, but Bottom line, after you look at all the qualifications and who might qualify to be in it and so forth, who picks the river community? The, well, there will be a process through which the applications, again, which come from the communities themselves, will be reviewed by uh, at least the interagency team. But this is a question, a specific question that we have posed for public, public comment. What is the best process we might uh, put together for the final selection of which rivers should be part of the program. Well, I'll just give you my public comment on that right now. It gets back to the Henry's Fork that has been working out in Idaho, and that is if you have a federal team picking who the community representatives will be, that doesn't quite, to me, sound like the, the community-based decision-making that will work. Uh, let me be clear, Congressman. I'm sorry. Um, the, at the end of the day, the selection process will not select the local community or the local plan or who at a local level participates. The only question is when we receive, which has been commented on before, what I think will be many, many more applications than the ten rivers we imagine. How do we pick our way through all of those applications to select the ten that we can focus on? And that's a question that we have posed for public comment. Who would be the best panel or body of people to help us make that decision. Then I think the question I'm trying to get at though then is whatever the title is or the name is, we're talking here about community-based decision making. Yes. I want to be sure that the people who live in the community are the ones who choose who's in their community. Is yes. that going to happen under this initiative? Yes, that would absolutely be the case. So we, aren't going to have, we are not going to have a federal team or a federal no. official who says, yes, this person's in the community, right. this no. person's not. No, we will not define the community, referring back to the earlier questions. We will then, not then how do does that. a community get qualified? I assume that to participate with the federal government in this yes. initiative, some river community has to become qualified to be a river community. Who decides what river community is qualified to be the river community? Well, what we're looking for is a broad spectrum of people 
but, but you're looking for, that's my point, is not what are you looking for, but who makes that final decision? Well, the reason I ask is because we are sure. having a dispute in Idaho right now sure. on another watershed where two groups are competing as to which one is the community mm -hmm. that gets to be involved in the collaborative decision-making process. And, and I want to know when that happens, right. do you or does a federal official decide under this initiative who is the river community? Well, that may be a very good example of uh, the broad support that will be looked for as these applications come forward. If it's the case that there is this uh, uh, significant disagreement in the community, that would be an application I would think that would have a very high hurdle to overcome. But bottom line is it will be decided here in Washington. It, what's decided here in Washington is only among the applications that we no doubt will receive, which ones can we focus on first. But the details of who's a member of the community, what does the community envision as its future, what tools, what assistance from the federal government does the community want and does the community not want, that will be purely and wholly in the province of local citizens. Okay, one last question, and I really should have spent my whole five minutes on this one, and that is, it seems to me that if we're going to try to facilitate, you and I have had many communications about the problems of managing the Columbia River system, and uh, it, it has all of the problems I think that any river system could present. Is this new decision-making body or this new effort going to actually have authority to make decisions like Endangered Species Act decisions, or will that still be decided in the current system that we have under federal law? All according to the current system. There's no new authorities uh, that are presented from this program. My time's up. I would like to explore with you why it would help to add another federal regime on top of the current system and not change the current system, but I guess I'll have to do that at another time. Maybe I can meet with you and we could discuss that. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentlelady from uh, Virgin Islands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your testimony, and I do share your enthusiasm for this initiative. I have three questions. Ms. McGlinty, you said that there were about 31,000 hits on the American Heritage webpage. About how many of them were opposed to the initiative? I would have to respond uh, in terms of exact numbers, but uh, we have received uh, overwhelming statements of support on this initiative. I mentioned the uh, Conference of Mayors unanimously voting in favor, and in fact, that, uh, that resolution was introduced by a Western uh, mayor, um, Wellington Webb from Denver, Colorado. Um, so the, we have just received significant amounts of, of positive interest and support for the program. Thank you. And uh, going back to the question that I raised in my opening statement, uh, I'm not sure who would be best to answer this, but is there any requirement that might preclude Salt River from uh, being designated if we chose to apply? Salt River and uh, maybe Secretary Babbitt. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Is there uh, anything that we'd be aware of now that, that would preclude, preclude the application? Yeah. Uh, I would be aware of nothing, but I enjoyed very much your recitation of the history of that river. Thank you. And then finally, I'm at a loss, and maybe you can help me to understand why uh, and where does the objection to this initiative come from? Because it recognizes and it supports the bond and the romance that people have always had with their rivers and which has been memorialized by many of our great poets. Uh, it protects a resource. It's locally driven. It cuts federal red tape. It encourages broad public comment. And it revitalizes our towns and cities. So I don't know. I'm trying to figure out where the objections come from. Well, we have uh, been a bit surprised ourselves. We've extended the public comment period to make sure that anyone who has a view gets a chance to comment. But as I reflected in my testimony, there have been some who have been afraid, for example, that the United Nations is somehow involved in this program, which we have been trying very clearly to s dispel any notion that that's the case. Uh, I don't know where ideas like that originate, but we certainly find them troubling and want to be of service to dispel those kinds of misapprehensions. Thank you. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, just the order that I have coming in, the next on the Republican side would be Smith, Chenoweth, Duncan, Cannon, Schaefer, and Doolittle. On the Democratic side would be Hinchy, Abercrombie, Romero Brasello, Kildee, and Falamavego. 
Anybody want to argue with that? Switch with your neighbor if that's the case. And, uh, and uh, John Peterson. Uh, John, I think you're just in front of John Doolittle, so uh, I know this is tense information for all of you, because, it's, but uh, I'll get to you, believe me. The lady from Washington is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of consensus, and one thing that um, I listened to the passion of Mr. Babbitt at the community efforts, and I share that passion. Uh, I've traveled the state and, and worked with many different groups in, in my region and other parts of the state. And the community successes are so great, but there's a joke in the communities. Uh, and it, it's about a farmer, but they often apply it to themselves. And it's a knock at the door, and the culmination of this joke is, we're the federal government, and we're to help, here to help you. And uh, it isn't really a very funny joke because many of them have so many overlapping federal interventions and they're already succeeding when they can get us with our good intentions out of their way. So I don't even question your passion or your good intentions. But you stated, as did Mr. Miller, who is now gone, all of these success stories that happened from individual initiatives, state cooperative efforts. Um, and now all of a sudden we've decided we're going to add another person. So I did want to clarify that to you, that, that it is the question of adding another layer, does that really bring it together? Or does it cause more questions? Is the Columbia River Gorge up first? Is the environmental uh, action up first? Um, all of these, is the issue of tributaries up first? See, we have so many different layers. Now you say you're going to cooperate and help coordinate, and it only will come from our state. But what we found in the Columbia River Gorge is those that were, by the way, the word connected scared the soup out of me. Connected meant that they hiked in the Columbia River Gorge. Now, very few of the folks that are administering that program really have much to do with the taking of property that has happened, as you can't even use your property in the Columbia River Gorge. But diverting back to my concern, it is very hard for all these communities that finally succeed when the federal government, no matter how well-intentioned you are, with another agency or another passion from your heart, to really believe that if they're already being successful, that they need your passion. With that, though, I'm going to turn back, Mr. Babbitt, to some uh, budget questions, because that's my heart. I'm real concerned about the bu budget. I've heard you testify about increasing people for environmental programs, increasing budgets, and how there is not enough money. I also believe that comes from your heart. But I guess my question is, you're asking for, and I've got the budget, are you going to ask for specific FTEs um, for the navigator position? If so, how many? Do you plan to submit a reprogramming request to the Congress for the use of the funds for an unauthorized program? So could you give me a preliminary on what your budget's going to look like uh, in the request for this new program? Then would you tell me, being you have too much money in other programs, which ones you're going to reduce the FTEs on in the other programs? Because again, you've testified so eloquently on not having enough money, and then travel the nation saying that uh, you didn't have enough money. So share with me why you have too much money now that you can start another program. Mrs. <clears throat> uh, Congress, Warren Smith, I, I appreciate your uh, uh, compliments on my eloquence. Uh, <laughs> Passion, but eloquence is fine. Passion. Uh, let me see if I can translate that into uh, just a couple of, of detailed observations. The first one that I'd like to re-emphasize to you is this kind of approach is grounded indeed in what is already happening. And it is a very new way of looking at how communities can achieve their results because decisions are not made by the agencies. Decisions are made by the communities who, in the process of working on 
river restoration inevitably turn to the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Park Service, the Environmental Protection Agency. And don't you see, there is a profound revolutionary distinction here because for the first time, this administration is saying to communities, you're in command. You go to those federal agencies and tell them what you want. And it seems to me that should be enormously appealing. Now, well, what have we learned in places like the Willamette Valley? Well, let me tell you what I've learned uh, from those experiences. <clears throat> when a community which is set out to restore its watershed begins to look around and says, uh, we need a hydrographic data set from the Geological Survey. <clears throat> We'd like a watershed analysis, a hydrologist actually, uh, from the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, we'd like a grant from the Natural uh, Resources uh, uh, Conservation uh, Service. Uh, we'd like some help from the Corps of Engineers. It gets pretty confusing, and what we've actually already found is it's very helpful to say to those communities, uh, we're going to put John Jones from the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, at the other end of the telephone. Mr. Barrett, I'd like to, I'm going to have to conclude. I'm understanding what you're saying. I don't understand why it has to be done with this action as you have it now, but my question isn't being answered. I have the spreadsheet on the expected FTEs needed for this new program. I understand your desire to coordinate, although from my experience we're already doing it and very successfully so. So would you please tell me where you are going to show us that you're going to shift FTEs, that's the employees, you're hiring a bunch of new employees, what agencies you're going to shift them from, or are you going to ask for an appropriation? If so, if so, would you please put that in writing? Because, see, we're supposed to pay the bills of the country, and we're supposed to authorize programs, and even though you think this is right, we probably should debate whether or not this new program is started. Okay, so well, if you would give us the budget numbers for that, that's what I'm really asking for. Uh, let me just briefly tell you what I might do and then refer you to uh, Ms. McGinty. Um, if push comes to shove, I think what I would probably do is call up the person from the Fish and Wildlife Service who's answering the phone in that river valley and say, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you're now the river navigator. Mm -hmm. So you would say the people that were providing a service before of answering the phone now would become the river navigator, so we really didn't need the person answering the phone? Oh, well, quite to the contrary. We do need the person answering the phone, and that's why they're answering it right now. We're just going to re call them something else now, uh, well, re retitle them. But how could they spend all their time as a river navigator when we needed us so desperately for answering the phone before? I guess what we need to do is you describe why we don't need the other services and why we need the, the new. Um, again, please give me in writing where you plan on reducing other services and adding this new vital... I, I, I would be very happy to um, I'm a gentle lady order Hester's Ms. Part. McGinty to provide you those uh, <laughs> Thank those you, figures. Mr. Davitt. Gentleman from New York. And I won't Mr. even Hinchy. need to reprogram my own funds to answer that request. Mr. Hinchy? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it seems to me that some of the opposition, at least, to this uh, program seems to be fairly even-handed. On the one hand, uh, some people are afraid that their communities will be designated and their rivers will be designated. And then on the other hand, they're worried that somebody else may be designated and thereby get the benefits that they won't. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting situation. The, uh, the points that you made in your, in your testimony about the, the voluntary nature of this uh, project are, of course, the ones that need to be overemphasized or emphasized again and again, because I think it is, it is tho those points that precisely answer some of the criticism, or what seems to be the criticism of the program. And I'm, I'm wondering, in the short period of time since the President announced the program and, and now, what kind of indications you've had of support from communities around the country? what kind of inquiries uh, you've, you've had for information, and uh, even what attempts there have been to make application for the program up to this point. 
We've had extensive um, statements of support for the program. Uh, I've mentioned the, uh, the mayor's resolution, but in addition to that, uh, mayors in different parts of the country are coming together themselves. In the upper Mississippi, there's some 20 mayors who are coming together voluntarily to say, we think that this can be a great economic driver for us if we get this label and this kind of uh, exposure on this program. Um, but in addition to that, we have heard from a diversity of interests. Local government, yes, but <clears throat> business concerns, uh, environmental and recreation concerns, <clears throat> excuse me, all different, uh, people from all different walks of life have been interested in this program. There have also been expressions of fear, um, <clears throat> even outrage, about the, some of the, um, the implications that are, are imagined to flow from uh, project like this? Of well, course. there have been some, and we have been determined to do our best to be responsive to those concerns. Uh, for example, just on Saturday, I traveled to Washington State to visit with a group called the Western States Coalition, a pro uh, property rights group that I know uh, Congresswoman Chenoweth spoke the night before uh, I did. And we are making ourselves available to every group no matter what their viewpoint, to share with them every piece of information we have and to get their ideas on how this program can best be formulated. And you've addressed this on a number of occasions, but I want to give you an opportunity to do so again, and that is the, with regard to uh, concerns about the regulatory nature of the program. My understanding <laughs> is that this is not a regulatory <laughs> program at all. This is a program that does not uh, vest in anyone any new regulatory authority, but merely seeks to uh, uh, coordinate more effectively and more efficiently those uh, activities that are being conducted by the federal government uh, often in uh, cooperation with state and local governments mm -hmm. and to bring the services that are deemed by virtue of present law necessary for the benefit of the people to flow to those constituencies more readily and more effectively. That's exactly right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the president is, I mean, there has been concern raised that the public isn't well enough aware of this program. Well, the whole point here is to shine a spotlight on resources that are already out there that the citizens of this country pay for, but they have little or no idea that they are there to be of service to them. So we are highlighting it for specifically that reason, so that citizens know about it and have an ability to access it. There is, I think, a great deal of concern uh, an interest and support for this program especially perhaps in the eastern part of the country, because as uh, Representative McHale observed, it, it is precisely the rivers in the eastern part of the country that have been the most abused for a longer period of time. But Secretary Babbitt makes the point that there are rivers also in the western part of the country, and the people in that part of the country are equally concerned about the health and vitality of, uh, of their rivers. And I know that there's been a lot of attention played, paid, uh, say, for example, to uh, the Columbia River Basin, and people there are concerned about it, and perhaps uh, Mr. Secretary, you'd like to speak to the kinds of activities that the federal government is engaged there in the Columbia River Basin and how a program like this might help to coordinate those activities and improve them. Uh, uh, Congressman, just a couple of, of, of thoughts. Um, I grew up alongside the Colorado River. That's a river which no longer reaches tidewater. I mean, it's not as if uh, uh, there hasn't been some development going on in the West. Uh, we're dealing uh, in the uh, California Day, Bay Delta with the San Joaquin River, which uh, doesn't make it uh, to the Delta. Uh, I do think that the, the restoration uh, issues in the West are, are uh, surprisingly similar uh, to the issues of the East. I would say that uh, in, uh, as a generalization, uh, that east of the Mississippi, we tend to be dealing with industrial pollution as uh, the number one issue. Uh, west of the Mississippi, uh, we tend to be worrying about uh, water quantity and efficient use and how it is we balance uh, uh, irrigation, hydropower, uh, fish runs uh, with uh, maintaining uh, in-stream flows that are adequate to uh, protect uh, all of the other values. I thank you all very much for your testimony and uh, your candid answers to these questions. Time gentlemen has expired. The lady from Idaho, Mrs. Chenoweth, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I um, 
I'd like to answer Mr. Hinchy's question since the Secretary didn't. What the federal government is planning on doing to the Columbia River is bypassing dams and, um, and taking that working river and, um, and no longer, no longer um, allowing us the ability to have low-cost hydroelectric power. Uh, you noticed the Secretary didn't want to answer your question. I do want to say that in the West we have working rivers because we are a working state. We also have enough rivers in our roadless and wilderness areas to put four eastern states inside our roadless and wilderness areas. So we have rivers of all kinds. So if the gentlelady would yield. I'll yield on your time, sir. <laughs> but I do want to say that um, I have before me an executive order that was drafted, Ms. McGinney. And so whether we have, we have the consent of Congress or not, um, I guess the President is going to go ahead and do this by executive order. Um, it, it states that it gives him, that NEPA and FACA give him the ability to um, combine 12 agencies and their resources and all the rules and regulations that empower these agencies to, to um, embark on this new program. I do not find anywhere in NEPA or FACA the authorization for the president to embark on this kind of program. Um, I would like for either you or Mr. Babbitt to give us a written opinion as to where, um, where the authority lies in these, two, uh, in these two statutes that he cited. I also want to refer, Ms. McGinty, to your, um, to your statement where you indicated that that some people are worried about this being um, brought on by the UN. And um, I do want to say that I have not heard anyone, anyone in this body talking about this project being connected with the UN. This is not an issue involving the UN. It is an issue involving states' rights and private property rights. You also indicated there was nothing about aerial photography. Um, but Surveillance. But well, you're very good at, at wordsmithing, but in your Federal Register publication you do talk about aerial photography. Yes. And there are enough photographs of our rivers uh, done by various agencies over, over the years that certainly the results of those photographs and, and, and satellite surveillances could, um, could certainly be utilized without having this in the Federal Register. People who have been concerned about aerial photographer photography probably have a reason to be concerned if it's in the Federal Register. Um, I do want to say that um, you talk about there being no new regulations and no new agencies, but Ms. McGinney, we're sitting here facing three, two people who sit on the President's Cabinet, and I imagine you sit in on it quite often. Um, we're, we're talking about three people who say there will be nothing new, and yet you're proposing to bring 12 agencies to bear on helping communities become empowered. Um, with all the rules and regulations behind them to enforce with, we don't exactly feel sanguine about this. We don't believe that you're really going to empower communities. And while my good colleague, uh, Congressman McHale from Pennsylvania, talked about President Roosevelt had to deal with the greed of the time when people misused our resources. Yes, he did. But indeed, this is what's happening as I listen to this testimony. You are proposing to use funds that the Congress has allocated for certain specific purposes and holding out the carrot of the dollars to certain communities, um, you're appealing to the nature of wanting more federal dollars in certain communities. And I think that would be fine if this particular White House um, were as, but if this particular White House were as concerned about balancing the budget, making sure that we can allocate the scarce resources, the scarce tax dollars into Medicare and Social Security and the needs of humans. This is almost a situation 
of Marie Antoinette saying, if the peasants don't have bread, let's give them cake. The problem is that when, when we find, the, and I agree with Mrs. Smith about the fact that, that the secretary, Mr. Babbitt, spoke very eloquently and passionately about floating from the rivers in the east through the Midwest into the west, floating down the Mackenzie and, and into the Willamette Valley. But sir, with all due respect, and I really mean this for the office that you hold, I suggest you spend time on the tidal basin, truly, or in the Anacosta River. Truly I do. This is where, this is the government city. And this is where you can set the example. Let's clean up our own house first and then look to the other areas that, uh, that may need to be cleaned up. But we already have the clean water standards that every, um, the, the areas that you talked about um, have already apparently responded to, to a degree, because they are restoring without this American Heritage Rivers initiative, communities are restoring themselves. Thank you. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from Hawaii, Mr. Robert Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Babbitt, Mr. Babbitt, here I am. There you are. <laughs> um, you're a little mesmerized at the moment, I expect. Um, <laughs> I, I realize I, I that. I thought she was, uh, the Congresswoman was uh, laying out her respect. For me, and then yes. she she broke the spell by saying, "I have utmost respect for the office." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That the person holds in the office. Yes. Truly, I do. Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Babbitt. Uh, I don't. I, I can't remember your entire background. I don't believe you're necessarily an engineer, but uh, one of the points that was made just uh, in this. Uh, past uh, admonition with respect to states' rights, property rights. Uh, expenditures and balancing the budget. If I wasn't mistaken in there, I heard the, the phrase low-cost hydroelectric power. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't a lot of that low-cost hydroelectric power come as a result of federal expenditures to see to it that, that people who are the beneficiaries of that get it at a heck of a lot lower cost than they would otherwise if they're paying for it themselves exclusively, locally? Congressman, I, I think that's a fair statement. Uh, there's okay, no question. Thank you. <laughs> so in other words, there is a role for the federal government, isn't there, when, when our house constitutes the nation's house and those of us who might not be the immediate beneficiaries of something like low-cost hydroelectric power nonetheless help to pay for it because we all consider ourselves brothers and sisters in this nation. Yield. No, I will not that yield. A, you can, yield, you can speak on your own time, I think, is the longer. expression. Mr. Chairman, could you direct the member, please, to allow me to have my own time? Tell her why it controls the time. You bet. Now, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Congress Mr. Babbitt, in uh, case you were not able to hear all of that, uh, is it not the case that there are instances in this country in which as a result of the utilization of our natural resources and a combination of federal dollars that comes from all of us, do we not regard each other as brothers and sisters in a house that constitutes the United States of America and are quite willing to help uh, with federal dollars, tax dollars, uh, different sections of the country, whether we benefit immediately from it or not, because we see it in the nation's interest. Congressman, uh, I share the sentiment which you have expressed. Thank you very much. Now, with respect to the local recommendations and, and the Heritage Rivers, let's get back to that. I realize it's not always uh, an easy task to determine which, is, uh, 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 which constitutes the voice of a community or communities. I think uh, Ms. McGinty uh, responded to that. Is it you, and if I understood her point uh, correctly, if there is contention at the local level or the regional level with respect to the suitability of a river or, or, or a river in a, in a, in a region being uh, uh, suitable, if there's, if, there's, if there's contention about that, if there's discussion, um, that would probably make it more difficult for them to ultimately then to be recommended, right? Congressman, I think that's correct, yes. Okay. Now, um, with regard to the recommendations, this does constitute a competition 
in some respects. That's a fair statement also, isn't it? Because sure. uh, many might call, but not everyone will be chosen, at least initially. Sure. It may take a period of time. Now, in that regard, then, um, uh, isn't the idea of the navigator, and, you know, this is a legislative process after all. You're not fixed on this, right? You could, we could, we could perhaps modify this if commentary uh, and, and uh, a testimony direct you in that direction. But if, that's the, if the case is that we generally come up with what you're proposing, isn't the object of the navigator and the object of the program to make available to local communities services of the federal government, which are already being paid for, about which they may not be necessarily aware? They that's, may not be fully informed, right? That's correct. Because along with regulation also comes, comes services, does it not? And, and those things are not necessarily always understood by everybody or um, immediately available to them. So would the duty of the navigator be to, to work something like with the base closures? I'm going to draw a parallel there. We have a base closure um, uh, coordinator uh, in, in, in my area that has been invaluable in terms of running interference between federal, local, state agencies and, and, and groups acting as a, in terms of good offices and, and as an honest broker. Would you see the navigator in that kind of a context? So, someone used the phrase facilitator, which okay, I thought was excellent. equally descriptive. Maybe that's even a, 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 a good job description for the navigator. Last question. Um, uh, and perhaps you could answer it more in, in writing to the chairman. Um, uh, I'm still not fully um, uh, uh, resolved on the question of the reprogramming of funds. I think the chairman has, uh, over and above the question then of the, pol the policy question, the chairman has a, 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 a key point to make, it seems, with respect to the question of reprogramming. I'm very ill at ease with the idea that there are funds that could be reprogrammed if it's going to come at the expense of that which we have already authorized and appropriated for. I will say that Mr. Hansen and Mr. Young, uh, uh, as well as the, uh, hope, hopefully with the, the uh, um, assistance of the minority, have worked very hard to, to see to it that dollars and positions are held to exactly where they should be, that there's not excess in them. I think Mr. Hansen prides himself on that, and I think that um, we need to have more information as to whether reprogramming is, is something that would be in order as opposed to additional funding if we decided to go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Appreciate the gentleman's comments and hope to follow up on your last question. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Utah, Mr. Cannon, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a long hearing, um, but, but there are a couple of things that I would actually like to focus on just for a moment. Uh, from the background documents that you are so kind to provide, Ms. McGinty, to the committee, uh, it's clear that you expect many applications for these river uh, projects, and therefore uh, one of the tasks you have is setting up criteria for, for how those would be uh, selected. <coughs> um, one, of, one of the documents you provided refers to uh, the selection process and says, selection committee will recommend more H AHRs than can actually be designated, giving someone else, Prin, the president, question mark, and Prin, a further choice. Uh, this could be in, uh, this could ensure that designated AHRs, colon, and then you have three start items, or your staff had developed three start items. <clears throat> Those read, serve political purposes, are located where agencies can staff them, uh, are diverse, Bren, river, landscape, community, geography, et cetera, and Bren. Uh, <clears throat> now, politics, of course, uh, a political purpose is, is broadly stated. Having mayors involved, of course, is, is certainly uh, uh, important in that. But would you also see this as being a forum where you would consider uh, how the president appears uh, to segments of the population as being important politically as a consideration? Well, that, that's not our intention. And again, this effort has been from uh, in every... Oh, pardon me. The, the question is, would that be a consideration that would be reasonable in the White House? How does the selection of this river as opposed to that river uh, affect the president? That would not be a consideration that would influence our view as to which river should or should not be designated an American Heritage River. You would not river. consider the implications on presidential politics of, of, of choosing a river? These applications are being derived from the bottom up. Right, it, but it, they are going to come and you will be able to choose them. And you're telling me that you wouldn't consider the implications of a choice of a river in presidential politics? 
We will Even though politics is clearly a consideration according to your, your staffing. We will consider whether there is a broad basis of support. No, I don't want the hierarchy. I only want to know, will you consider the implications of we a choice? We have no intention uh, of making me. this decision on the basis of politics. And I personally have no, no. spent, I think, more time uh, me, with Gitty. Republican if, mayors, if for may, example, on this the, the program than Democratic ones. The question is not a question of uniqueness. Are you telling this committee that you will not consider presidential politics? in a choice of rivers when you have a choice between two that are very close? And I will answer again, I have no intention of considering politics and making the decision. Then, this is a program that will recognize... Pardon, wait a minute, wait a minute, pardon me. I, I'm not suggesting that politics is not an appropriate consideration, but it clearly is. That's how we live in America. Clearly your staff has already considered politics an appropriate consideration. I'm only trying to uh, figure out whether you're saying you know, what levels and what kind of consideration you're going to give to this. Are you telling this committee that you will not consider presidential politics in the process of, of picking uh, a, one river as opposed to another where, the, where they may be close? Our eloquent secretary helps me with a single word answer. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. We will not consider presidential politics. And yes means no, politics. you will not. Okay. Exactly Does right. Does that mean you will, also not, you will also not consider congressional politics? We will How the effect of a river choice will affect a congressional candidate? We will consider the views of the elected representatives of the people in question, uh, but Smitty, I don't equate I that would like, with I, politics. I have a short time, and I want to cut to the chase here. I mean, the president, just two, a week ago or so, has talked about how he can advance the interests of, of his presidency by gaining control of this House. Are you telling me that you will not consider, in the process of choosing between river designations, the difference between the effect on uh, uh, congressional races? Yes, I am telling you, I will not. Well, uh, that absolutely strains credibility. You also told the governor and the delegation of Utah that you had no uh, plans, no imminent plans to designate 1.7 million acres in southern Utah, and that was clearly political and clearly intended to enhance the, uh, the position of the president. Let me just close by saying <coughs> pardon me, whew, that um, Mr. Uh, Glickman has, has pointed out that this facilitator, which I think is a better term, will have a tendency to be able to focus the resources that already exist and, and listed several agencies, uh, the Forest Service, uh, the Conservation Service, the Extension Service, on these kinds of programs. What that, and, and I think, Ms. McGinty, you use the term using a spotlight or highlighting these kinds of things. What you do when you do that is distort the process. You can't take resources, unless we've overfunded you, Mr. Glickman, out of the system and put them into this kind of a program without changing the nature and the usage of those resources. You can't, uh, you can't spotlight without distorting. Uh, I was pleased, I, I, as I finished my opening statement, my colleague from uh, Washington leaned over and said, now, do you have an opinion on this matter, Mr. Cannon? <laughs> the fact is, I have opinions. I was pleased that the Secretary uh, made his position clear when he uh, said uh, that the Congress was taking a wrecking ball to the environmental laws of this country. Let me say, I believe in process, and I believe in the rule of law, and I believe that if we do that, we will be fine in America whether we're Democrat or Republican. On the other hand, the, the bald statement that, that, that presidential politics will not be considered in this reallocation of resources around America, I don't think is credible, and therefore I think you should reconsider. Thank may, you. May I just make one quick comment? Uh, 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 Mr. Secretary, go ahead. I think it's important to recognize, again, from USDA's role, we're out there spending a lot of taxpayer resources on important things and I want to go back. We have a, a model. We have a couple models. One's called our RCND model. It's Resource Conservation Development Model, where we help and facilitate community involvement and in conservation projects. That's been going on for a very long time. But the other model is the Empowerment Zone Enterprise Community Model, where communities come together, come up with the program, use the existing resources. And if you go to these Empowerment Zones Enterprise Communities, it is extraordinary what they have done themselves with already appropriated assets out there, deciding for themselves how best to allocate them, and using our help to facilitate working through bureaucratic roadblocks. That's, and it works very well. That's basically what, what we're talking about here. May I respond to that, Mr. Chairman? The, the Secretary uh, has said he cannot understand why conservatives and Republicans are opposed to this kind of grassroots activity. It, we're not. We believe in grassroots activity. I think that Mr. Crapo I went to great lengths to describe how a project like this on the grassroots roots is working in Idaho. What we're concerned about is the distortion of, uh, of the political system 
through diverting resources one way or another or creating facilitators or, or choosing parts of the nation as opposed to other parts in a very broad con or, or program that has virtually no controls. That's the problem. We believe in grassroots. We also believe that if, if programs are, are so bureaucratic that they, they need a facilitator or a navigator to get through them, that maybe those programs ought to be eliminated and give the money back to people at the grassroots level so they can choose how they wish to use those resources. Thank you. I'll, I'll yield myself one minute, Chris. Uh, you know, uh, it's been an interesting debate and uh, probably a very intriguing and interesting idea. But we don't know the details. And frankly, I think it comes down to process. I'm not sure how the process works. And you'll have to excuse us for being just a little suspicious, but uh, some of us, when you talk about all of the people that you've talked to, we didn't see that happen, as Mr. Cannon brought up in the monument. We were specifically excluded, especially when we're starting to subpoena the records on this and find out that it was done strictly for political reasons. And we find out that we extinguish protection and we have 1.7 million acres of rolling sagebrush surrounded by beautiful parks. Makes a lot of us wonder. I honestly think when you just said a minute ago, Kathleen McKinney, that you would consider the views of the representative a few months ago, we were not only considered, we were specifically excluded. Therefore, possibly you can't blame us for being a wee bit suspicious. We would hope that we see a little more openness from the administration this time. I don't think we intend to dismiss this proposal out of hand, but we would like to put out the hand of fellowship and work with you if we could. We can't, and we go to the mat, as we've done in the past. And, you know, we have our tricks in the bag, just like you folks do, too. Please don't take it personally. I have great respect for all three of you. But I would hope that we could work together if we can work something out. We can't, of course. We'll try to put moratoriums, and we'll try to block you with money, and we'll try to block you with legislation. But please, I would hope that we could somehow uh, remove this suspicious, but right now, uh, I don't think there's a good feeling towards some of our members as has been illustrated today, predicated on past performance. I've used my entire minute almost, and thank you for listening to me. Gentlemen from uh, America Samoa, uh, I've got, uh, no, did you, do you think Mr. Kildee's next? If you want to argue about this, yield to one another. I recognize you for five minutes. The uh, chair, uh, ranking member of the subcommittee of lands and uh, National Thank you, Parks. I, uh, it's not very often that this committee has the privilege of having the presence of the two distinguished members of the President's Cabinet, Secretary Babbitt and certainly our former colleague, Secretary Clickman. I'm very, very happy to uh, have them both here with us this morning, and certainly Ms. McGinty uh, also representing the Council on Environmental Quality. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I think it was about a month ago I saw a full page. Uh, article, believe it or not, it was the Denver Post in Colorado uh, outlining the recent development or establishment of a 9,000 acre national park in my district. And I want to say that uh, I want to personally commend Secretary Babbitt for taking the time to come to American Samoa and dedicate this national park. Uh, that means a lot to the Samoan people. Uh, this national park includes a very rare rainforest in our nation. It has about 55 species of rare birds. It also contains over 200 plants of medicinal value that is now being studied at the National Institute of Health for Cancer Research. And Secretary Babbitt, I can't thank you enough for your coming to our little island territory and the privilege of not only seeing that the coral formations that we have uh, in this island territory is one of the rarest in the world. These coral formations about as big as this chamber, this room. But for your presence, I just want to make sure that uh, we want you to know that on behalf of our people, we're very appreciative of your work and your being with us. I uh, just wanted to clear for my information um, from Ms. McGinty and Secretary Glickman and Secretary Babbitt that as far as the administration is concerned, the administration has not exceeded its authority in any way or form as far as any statutory sense of violations or any laws or anything that is passed by the Congress. You are acting strictly within the confines 
of the current law. Am I correct on that? Absolutely. And we feel not only do we have the authority, but the absolute responsibility and obligation to manage the programs that this Congress has, has directed us to manage in the most efficient, effective, and responsible way possible. And maybe I wasn't very clear on, we keep throwing around 10 rivers, and I'm sure the fact that we have hundreds of rivers in our nation, uh, is, uh, can you kind of explain a little more specifically, you have not selected the 10 rivers. You're in the process of uh, receiving applications from all sectors of our country. And that, is there a magic number to 10, uh, or is this just a beginning, at least, for you to consider seriously on how to uh, take into the President's initiative on this? It is just the beginning to see if it works and, and to take uh, some steps forward and see um, how that all plays out. We have not yet begun to receive applications because we have been going the extra mile to make sure citizens are involved in the design of the program, even down to the application form and what it should look like. We are receiving extensive comment on that. And so we won't actually even begin to receive applications until uh, sometime in September. Maybe this is probably the bottom line of the concern, not only, I'm sure, of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, but on this side as well is the cost factors, potentials. You're talking about the idea that, uh, and, and I'm sure that every American has always wanted this idea that we need to clean up our rivers. Talking about rivers that are connected to chemical plants, mm -hmm. rivers that are connected to nuclear power plants, sawmills, uh, the kind of situation where obviously uh, environmental issues are very, very serious. And I'm making a similar analogy of the fact that we need to also clean up America's nuclear waste uh, you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars potential. And I wanted to ask uh, our friends, uh, is there been any cost estimate taken by the administration of the potentials, not just for cleaning up 10 rivers, what about other rivers that are just as important perhaps, not just to the eastern side of, the, of our country, but all over the country? Do you see this as a foreseeable problem? Uh, I, I see that we're kicking around $2 million, but I'm sure that this is, this is just a, a tip of the iceberg. Are you looking at seriously the problem that it's going to cost the American taxpayer for cleaning up these rivers if this is what is necessary that we have to do? Uh, not through this program. And that's, I appreciate the question because it enables us, I think, to address the question that's been asked about reprogramming and new programs. This is only about the better execution of current programs. We don't envision new funds or, of any kind or new programs or new initiatives of any kind. This is just reinventing the delivery service of current programs. So basically somewhere down the line the administration, if it feels that there will be a necessity for asking for funds, then it will at that appropriate time come and ask the Congress yes. for further legislation that will uh, uh, not only enhance the initiative but clarify even more the cost factors. Yes, but this again is only right now trying to coordinate current authorities and appropriations. There's no intention to build up a new initiative or a new, wholly new program here and seek new monies. There's no intention to do that at all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. McGinty, you mentioned, and um, I'm quoting, that this is a historic opportunity to coordinate uh, mm -hmm. um, well, I guess this is where the quote ends, to coordinate, coordinate uh, historic opportunity to coordinate the services and, and efforts of, uh, other, of, of several agencies and so on. I, I would like to, like to ask you, what makes it impossible for the, this kind of coordination to occur today? It does occur today, and it's, uh, in every instance, it's, it's a different set of agencies that necessarily need to be brought together, et cetera. But what we have found is that there are communities across the country specifically trying to organize themselves around rivers and specifically asking in that instance, we would like help more easily to access the federal resources that we pay for. But what is preventing that to, to occur, to make it more easily accessible today? Well, this is evidence that it is happening, and we are furthering it along. That's the when purpose you said, of When this. you mentioned the word historic, what, what was it you were referring to? Uh, I could refer back, I guess, to the actual quote. I said, this is a historic effort, opportunity to support efforts of our communities to revitalize their riverfronts. The uh, uh, Secretary Babbitt, as I recall, you were present when the president was in Nevada 
and sign the uh, executive order on the uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, in Arizona. Right. Arizona. I'm sorry. I thought it was Nevada. Okay, in Arizona. Uh, since that time, the, the, Utah, the entire Utah delegation has gone on record as opposing uh, that particular uh, measure. The Utah State Legislature has. The governor has. Virtually every elected official representing that state has gone on record in an official capacity opposing it. I, my question to you is, is are, are you supporting or promoting any effort to repeal that designation in Utah? Absolutely not. I support the President's action of, uh, Let me 100%. move up to Idaho for a moment. The grizzly bear reintroduction in that area is opposed by the Governor, opposed by the, Utah, the Idaho Legislature, opposed by the Idaho Delegation. Are you supporting any effort to repeal the grizzly bear reintroduction in, in Idaho? Uh, I am supporting, uh, Congressman, an ongoing effort, I think, of considerable promise uh, to structure uh, a local advisory committee for the first time under the Endangered Species Act, which is going to pioneer uh, an entirely new way of working these reintroduction issues. Now, yeah, uh, the governor's... Time. It's a, it is a, it, as far as the details of the program, I'm just trying to ask whether there's any effort that you are supporting to repeal the initiative? Uh, absolutely not. Okay. Now, the, uh, this is for Secretary Glickman, I suppose. The Biosphere program was uh, one that was defended and explained in front of the Resources Committee recently, and one of the ex executives and uh, directors in your agency um, was confronted with the question of the Kentucky State Legislature has, in fact, opposed that initiative. And, uh, and I'm curious as to whether you or your department is supporting the repeal of the Biosphere initiatives in Kentucky. I, I do not believe we have been actively involved in that issue. Uh, I'll check on that for you, but I, 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 not in Kentucky. Let me ask uh, Ms. McGinty a, a, a related question. Let's suppose that a city within the state uh, puts in, uh, it secures the, the American Heritage designation under, the, under this act, and then a state legislature through a resolution or the governor or the delegation from that state requests that the designation be repealed. Will that program be repealed, that designation be repealed? Well, we certainly would take that extremely seriously, and I would think that that could prove fatal to the initiative, yes. Do, do you un understand how many of us from Western states may not take great comfort from that assurance here today, given the explanations you just heard on other programs that have been initiated in other states where the, where the official opinion stated by elected officials, governors, state delegations has gone ignored? Well, I respect your view, certainly, um, but the whole point here is to be responsive, actually, to other principles this Congress has laid out in terms of locally I'm driven to beat initiatives. Let me this, this light here. Oh. You, uh, on May 19th, you uh, submitted to the Congressional Record, the Federal Register, rather, the um, details of, of the plan and gave uh, 21 days to. Um, uh, for, for public comment. Now, the Ad Administrative Procedures Act suggests 60 to 90 days. Why was 21 days uh, suggested, and, and why May 19th? That, that was on the heels of an intensive four-month process that involved public meetings in every region of the country with hundreds of people participating, uh, 31,000 people uh, accessing and using the home page that was set up for this, a hotline set up. Uh, it was at the heels of a much longer public process, and again, it has been extended. Ask, there are many of us who are concerned about private property. In fact, in, in Colorado and many Western states, water rights are allocated as a property right within our state constitutions. The, um, let, let me ask, is if the program is truly voluntary, as you say, and non-regulatory, would the administration be willing to write into the program a mandatory and explicit opt-in provision whereby private landowners along the designated Heritage River or, or holders of water rights in the in river in question could only be included if they gave their written permission to be included? Well, we are in the middle of receiving broad public comment, and that is something we certainly will consider and give top priority to as well. Do you have any plans to, uh, to include that at the moment? I just don't want to prejudge the ability of the public to comment at this point. I think it wouldn't be appropriate to prejudge the uh, conclusion of a public comment process. My time has run out, apparently, apparently Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, appreciate your patience. Uh, Mr. Secretary, 
both Mr. Secretaries and the rest of the panel. I, coming from uh, the Great Lakes State, uh, Michigan, where Dan, you studied, um, I understand better than many the importance of rivers, lakes, and, and streams to our society. Uh, in 1992, I wrote uh, the law that protected uh, 100, 1,000 miles of uh, rivers throughout the state of Michigan under a different act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers uh, Act. And at that time, that was really opposed by a great number of people. I can recall, I, I can recall going for hearings in, in the Upper Peninsula, in which there were signs out, kill the kill the bill. But you know, what's happened since then is that uh, uh, it's being lauded by local governments. Uh, I get thanks for what I did back then. Uh, and local citizens are, are lauding it. I, I think sometimes there is a, a certain fear of the unknown. I think that's why we have hearings like this. But uh, really, uh, at, in 92, I was kind of a bum up there, and now I'm kind of a hero for, for having uh, done some things to help preserve uh, those rivers, which do refresh and refurbish the Great Lakes uh, every day as they pour into them. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very uh, interested in this bill. I know. Um, uh, Mayor Dennis Archer of the, uh, whom I know you know very well, of the city of Detroit, uh, is th thinking of a, having Detroit apply mm -hmm. as for one of the rivers to be designated as such. And there would really be an example of, of the mixed use, which I know you're concerned with. Uh, some areas, the Asaba River, should be used for only certain things, not, not the uh, the commercial ships that uh, come in from Germany or Sweden, as we see in the Detroit River. But in the Detroit River, you, you, you can see a Swedish ship coming down, a German ship coming down, coming through the Great Lakes uh, uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. You can find uh, uh, recreational use on that river. You can find uh, fishing in the river. You can find uh, even speedboat racing on the river, of multiple use. Mm -hmm. And the city of Detroit, is interested in using and upgrading that great waterway, the Detroit River, uh, which uh, is a boundary between the United States and Canada at that point, uh, to really up, upgrade its economy in, in a mixed use. And that mixed use certainly would fit well into uh, the, uh, the Heritage Bill, would it not? Mm -hmm. In fact, the mayor has spoken to me uh, about his interest in this, and in his mind, just to pick up what Secretary Glickman has said, with the wonderful experience Detroit has had with the empowerment zone, the Ren Sen coming back and being uh, uh, General Motors coming back into Renaissance Center, he sees this as a very logical extension of that progress. Exactly right. You know, the new General Motors building is right yeah. in that Renaissance zone. Right. I, I just drove by it yesterday as I was coming coming back from Michigan. And uh, although it's not part of my district, and uh, some wonderful things are happening in the, in the uh, enterprise zone, the empowerment zone down there, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, this would be a great addition uh, to Detroit. I would certainly hope that that'd be a, a river that would be considered. But I think that those who think that this is going to take uh, a river and, and uh, negate something in the economy. The mayor of Detroit recognized this as something that would be very positive to the economy. This is multiple mixed use, which that river certainly lends itself to. And I, uh, I certainly would hope that uh, he does apply and that consideration be given to that, to that because it's, uh, Detroit is making a, an enormous comeback and that would be a, a great thing in that. Let me ask a question of, uh, of Mr. Wayland uh, uh, from the EPA. Um, can you uh, cite uh, an example of uh, watershed uh, uh, projects that uh, have achieved uh, environmental results and enjoy broad uh, community support? Uh, that is, industry and local government, farmers and ranchers. Are, can you give us some examples of, uh, of uh, some watershed projects that have that I, kind of support? I'd be delighted, Congressman. And there are so many to choose from, it's difficult to sort of know where to go. And the Secretary earlier spoke about Henry's Fork. Uh, I think we're very proud of our involvement in the Clear Creek watershed above Denver. It's a municipal water supply source for the city of Denver, uh, affected by many abandoned hard rock mining operations. Uh, it had lost its ability to support uh, aquatic life. Uh, it's a recreational river which uh, uh, 
presented some hazard to those who were, who were uh, looking to shoot its rapids. Um, the local governments, the state of Colorado, EPA, other federal agencies, Coors Brewing Company, many private sector interests have been working for over three years uh, collaboratively to identify an action plan to undertake uh, the cleanup and, uh, and protection of that river. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a very inspiring story, one that we're very pleased to be associated with. We have a facilitator. She's a Superfund Remedial Project Officer. Uh, Holly Flinio uh, is the EPA person who works with that community and our resources have helped to fund a local facilitator. Uh, Carl Norbeck uh, is on the ground. I've visited this watershed many times and I've seen tremendous progress as we, as we look at people pulling together uh, and they've enlarged their circle of interest as they've seen progress built in, in steady uh, and, and slow stages from addressing the most serious problems of ecological contamination to, to other opportunities that they have a shared vision for. Thank you. And I, just before I finish, I'd like to uh, commend uh, Secretary Babbitt for not only your interest in the environment, but uh, take this time to commend you for your interest in the rights of Native Americans, including your latest statement on the Interior Appropriations Bill. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Peterson. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for coming before us. I consider it a real pleasure, pleasure as a freshman member of Congress to have the chance to visit with two cabinet people and a top advisor to the president simultaneously. Only time will not allow me to ask you the questions I'd like to, but I'd like to share a couple thoughts with you first. As a freshman member of Congress, um, I guess I'm a little surprised that your sensitivity to being questioned so hard with this program uh, uh, and, and showing some annoyance uh, even that uh, how dare they question this grassroots up program. Uh, I come from northwestern rural Pennsylvania, the largest rural district east of the Mississippi. It's more, mostly timber, it's mostly rural. It's uh, three beautiful rivers of Pennsylvania flow through my district. So I'm rural America at its best. Uh, when I look at what's happened in rural Pennsylvania and in the rural west, uh, I'd like to share with you, and, and all of you are veterans of public policy, uh, You've, you've been around the mill. You, uh, uh, I guess I, that was why I was surprised at your sensitivity to being questioned so hardly. Because we live by perception. The perception in rural America, and, and, I'm, and, and I don't mean this in any personal way, because you're very nice people, but people fear Katie McGinney in rural America. People fear Mr. Babbitt. Because of the first four years of this administration, Rural America is struggling. And I think the issue that bothers me is the bigger issue. The rural economy is far more fragile. We just heard from Mr. Kildee that, you know, Detroit loves these ideas and, and ready to embrace, but that's a city and urban area. The rural economy is so narrow. When you lose a portion of it, uh, you, you don't recover the same as an urban suburban area does. Rural America is struggling and kind of hanging on by its fingernails in many parts of this country and parts of my district. And that's why the sensitivity from rural legislators that I think you need to think seriously about. Uh, we are struggling. You know, the, the, the worst policy is a policy that takes away a person's job and a right to earn a living and feed their family. And when economies go down, the question of the National Monument had big impacts. Uh, your enforcement of the Endangered Species Act, uh, your, some of your property right policies or insensitivities there, timber issues, uh, recreational policies. All of those, whether we have hydropower in the future or not, those are all questions that are fearful in the hearts of rural people. So I guess I'd like to share with you that why there's a lot of questions from rural legislators is people in rural America are scared of their economic future. And I guess uh, what you have to deal with, whether this is the most perfect program in the world, is history. And history is that, that, that you've not been as sensitive to how things have impacted the rural economy as you should have been. At least that's how people in the 5th District feel. May I just comment, if possible, because, Mr. Peterson, I, I understand it. I live with it because I run, I'm Secretary of the Rural Department. I view myself as an advocate for people who live in underserved areas that often don't benefit by population and by industrial development, often lose access because of banks closing or, or highways not as good or air service is not there or electric rates higher. So, I mean, you know, this is a big part of what I do and we spend billions of dollars a year on water systems, sewer systems, 
rural development projects generally. But I guess what I'm saying is, is that rural America needs a spark to, to expand, to develop, to create this economic growth that we've often seen in areas in urban America. And we have to look at different options um, rather than just all of the traditional options. Uh, one of the great things we have is there are advocates up here on Capitol Hill for rural America. It's made a massive difference. But I go back to this idea. I went down to the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, one of the poorest areas in the country, heavily rural, heavily fresh fruit and vegetable, in bad shape economically, one of the highest unemployment rates in the United States. They sat down, they said, we got to jumpstart this rural America. We're going to die unless we do something different. So they became one of the empowerment zones. Now this is this concept where they got together collaboratively and they decided what they needed to do to marshal their resources. They've, they, what, through that, they have been able to do a lot of things on economic development, new jobs, uh, enhancing their educational opportunities, and, and in fact, attracting industry from ur urban America as well. So I, I want you to know that from my perspective, and I, I think Secretary Babbitt and, and Katie McGinney agree, is, is that we view this as a way to facilitate rural America, not hurt it, help it. Saying comment that the agriculture department was not included in that fear, and, and this isn't personal, but but I, I'm, I'm serious about the interior department and, and some of your policies. The, rural America is frightened by them because it's it's in the big picture, they don't feel you feel their pain and 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 the fragileness of the rural economy. Rural America is hurting, and in in future policies, and I think that's why you have problems with this proposal, though it may be perfect, is history. They don't think you've been sensitive enough to how these proposals in the last four years have affected, not the agriculture department, but the other, uh, rural America. Do you have any comment to that, Mr. Bevan? Congressman, I appreciate the uh, intensity of your uh, concern and your remarks, and I, uh, I indeed believe that there's a, a substantial amount of, uh, of real fact and perception out there that uh, uh, needs to be dealt with. And I guess what I would say is that um, I think the way to do that uh, is to try to step away from the broad generalizations and move toward specifics out on the landscape. And I would only say to you without uh, prolonging this unnecessarily uh, that we've tried very hard to be site-specific, to get down on the ground, to uh, engage uh, and to kind of step away from a rhetorical debate which uh, I think uh, simply isolates us all from each other. And I appreciate very much uh, the context uh, and the insights that you offer. I think they're fair, and I think it's our obligation to be responsive. Ms. McGinty, did you have anything to say? Just to second it and to, to recognize and to, um, I guess, just to offer at any time that we can be personally and immediately available to constituents of yours who have concerns. That's our obligation and responsibility, and we will do it immediately. Okay, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that I think sometimes what is looked at is, uh, or tried to be, we get into a political debate and we shouldn't because real America is real America, whether it's Republican or Democrat, doesn't really matter. But real America is in trouble, economically. I, I don't think many people argue with that. And I, I think we need to look in the multitude of uh, programs that are in, and changes that are happening simultaneously. A number of them have impacted real America, uh, not positively. And that's the concern we have, and I'll, I'll be critical of Congress. I don't think this Congress is as sensitive as I'd like it to be to rural issues. And I think as I'm here a while, people will realize that, that I'll be very outspoken about rural. I was in Pennsylvania state government, and I will be here because it's where I come from and it's who I represent. Thank you. Any of the members have uh, any further questions for this panel? Uh, looks like we've got, all right, we'll go back over to this side. Mr. Chairman, I, I Gentlemen's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, I have no further questions. and. Uh, I certainly would like to associate myself with the gentleman from Michigan's uh, earlier statement in thanking Secretary Babbitt for his sensitivity and support of Native American issues, which is part of this committee's jurisdiction. Uh, we have a saying when the chiefs uh, where I come from meet in council, they all sit cross-legged. And when we've been doing this for four hours, one of the chiefs will then exclaim, the mat is hot, will the villain follow? So I think with that uh, statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank uh, our two distinguished members of the President's Cabinet, Ms. McGinty, our friends from EPA and, and the Department of the Army for being here this morning. The mat is hot, and I think it's time we ought to go home. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Recognize the gentlelady from Idaho for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to follow up on the President's executive order mm -hmm. where he cites NEPA. And um, I'll direct this question to Mr. Babbitt. Um, since the President has cited NEPA as the tool for his, um, for his authority to engage in this program, has the White House planned or have they completed an environmental impact statement which definitely is clearly required in NEPA for any major federal action as has been interpreted by numerous Supreme Court decisions? Congresswoman, it, it's not, uh, I am a recovering lawyer. I am now uh, uh, in a different line of work. But uh, it, it's not at all clear to me uh, that this is the kind of situation uh, where an environmental impact statement uh, is uh, desirable or required. Uh, but I obviously defer to the lawyers. And the reason, I think, is that it's really important to see this as a, uh, an enhancement of a whole series of ongoing issues. Uh, this isn't uh, so much a new program as it is the President of the United States exercising his power to say to 13 federal agencies, I see some good things out there, and I'd like to put the weight of my office on behalf of all Americans behind what you're doing. And I'd like to showcase successful efforts. I would like to admonish agencies to learn from those efforts, to step up their efforts, and to be certain that they're facilitating. I would be interested in another legal analysis based on whether this constitutes a major federal action as defined in... I will uh, happily uh, direct Ms. McGinty to uh, uh, respond to that. <laughs> on your budget, right? And um, whether this constitutes a major federal action and based on previous Supreme Court decisions with regards to that triggering the need sure. for uh, an environmental impact statement. Would you like me to comment now? or? Uh, this, this program derives from the National Environmental Policy Act and in fact it's an example of what the National Environmental Policy Act requires. Every agency in every policy, every program, every action they undertake is directed by the National Environmental Policy Act to achieve an integration and coherence among environmental, economic and social considerations. That has not been, as some of your constituents I think would probably tell you, very effectively uh, exercised in the past. Yes, we've had some environmental decision making. Has it effectively incorporated economic and social considerations? Not always. This program is about saying you've got to achieve that integration that NEPA directs you to achieve. I think that there's a term that I've heard the Secretary use. It's called cumulative impact. And this is a this coming together of 12 or 13 different agencies for a new single purpose, I believe, would constitute a major federal action. And that's my concern. And so that's how I'm framing the question at you. I do understand your answer, but I, I have a concern along this line. And I have a couple of questions I'd like to, to ask you also, if you don't mind. On April uh, 16th, uh, 1997, a memo from CEQ about this program lists the AmeriCorps as one federal agency that was helping draft the Heritage Rivers budget proposal. AmeriCorps is largely an agency that deals with social issues such as poverty and education. Does this indicate that the Rivers program will go beyond the environment and engage in social action issues like poverty and hunger. Precisely. Integrating social, historical, cultural, economic opportunities into environmental issues that, to achieve that integration, yes. And what organizations representing private property owners, if any, did the administration consult with before the president announced this program? Uh, well, we have consulted with many organizations who have private property rights concerns. I personally have had the uh, representatives of the property rights groups who visited Washington in June in my office. On f Saturday, as I mentioned, the Western States Coalition to whom you uh, spoke on Friday night, I also uh, visited and spoke with them on Saturday. Uh, we have visited with the American Farm Bureau. They've been part of this. We have accepted every invitation they have sent to us. 
any organization that has raised that concern, we have responded to it immediately. I, I won't go on, but with this one simple statement, most of those people met with you after this was published, though, in, on May 19th. And so I think the course was already set. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Schaefer is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This uh, question that you answered about, uh, about uh, social and, and uh, historical and, and environmental um, um, considerations being given great weight to, with the respect of how we manage rivers is, a, is of great concern to people in the West, I can assure you. Again, our Constitution, which is the primary definitive document as to how we allocate and distribute water rights in our state and in other states like that, place great weight on the economic aspect of water allocation and appropriation. Water rights in Colorado and most Western states is a property right, plain and simple. I guess my question is, do you believe that it is, that it is possible that the that this initiative could change the allocation or the distribution of water rights within a state? No. Very good. Let me ask, uh, many people are concerned, again, along the lines of the, the property rights issues that you had described, are concerned about the, the erosion of, of these rights, and they're concerned about their tax dollars going to hire federal bureaucrats, which in fact go lobby against them before some county commission or water board or, or water court and so on. I would like to ask in order that to allay those concerns and in fact reaffirm the statements that you made today that this has no impact on property rights. Um, would the administration be willing to incorporate a provision prohibiting these river navigators and all other federal employees involved with this program from intervening in local zoning and land management decisions involving private property? We will reiterate and direct in the strongest possible terms, and in fact the terms that we will adopt are President Reagan's terms admonishing the agencies about the sanctity of private property rights, yes. So, ha having said that, that sounds, pretty, th that sounds pretty strenuous, the way you state that. So is there anything then that you can see that would prevent you from, from, uh, suggest or from, from prohibiting river navigators and all other federal employees involved in this program from intervening in local zoning and land management decisions involving property, right, private property? The river navigator, facilitator, whatever we wind up ultimately calling this uh, person, will do only those things that the local community call on them, ask, request of them to do. What prevents you from making a commitment to this committee today that these river navigators and other federal employees associated with this program will be prohibited from being involved in local zoning and, and land, uh, land management decisions? I'm, I'm just trying to be very clear that there is no part of this program which is about encouraging or fomenting or setting up a situation <laughs> Very good. Having We're, said that, uh, is there anything that prevents you from making com a commitment to this committee today that you will prohibit these river navigators and other federal employees associated with this program from, local uh, from intervening in local zoning and land management decisions? I just believe that I would need to understand the situation that you are pointing to and the problem that occasions your question more, and I'd be happy to visit with you about it before I, I Let I me tell you, your reluctance apologize. to essentially promise this committee that what you had said earlier about the sanctity of property rights is, is very troubling. And, and you know, I went through a whole litany of, of examples, and it doesn't stop with the ones that I ticked off in this committee. Time after time after time, this administration has ignored the, the stated and official policy positions taken by governors, state legislators, delegation members. Um, I, again, you've stated most emphatically that this will have no impact on private property. All I want to know is if you can promise this committee that these new federal agents, these new federal bureaucrats associated with this program, who you say will have no impact on local zoning, no impact on, local, on land management decisions, will, net, will, will be prohibited, flat out prohibited, from participating in a county commission meeting or uh, where, where, where zoning is concerned. Now, there's nothing inconsistent with with that request and what you have stated on the record here today, yet you're still not willing to make that commitment formally to this committee. And I, I just want to know what prohibits you from, from, what prohibits anybody here from making the commitment that, that uh, essentially the statements that you have made are something that warrant the, the, the uh, uh, backing them up in the proposal and making the commitment to the committee. Congressman, let me, if I may, uh, give you an example that occurs to me. 
Well, it may be well, uh, it may well be possible out there somewhere that a Department of Agriculture official will be involved in a facilitator role. The way you phrase this, you would be asking the Department of Agriculture to refrain from enrolling private property in the Conservation Reserve Program. Now, th that is in fact a decision that relates to the management of private property. No, so I, I would suggest Mr. that Secretary, Mrs. McGinty, I, I McGinty is correct. Related to this program, this is a new program no, that's no, being proposed. The, the, Congressman, the whole point is that we have spent the last three hours describing how the purpose of what we're doing is to facilitate and put together existing programs, of which the Conservation Reserve Program is one. But with respect to this program and local zoning and local management decisions involving property rights, you, you, the, your CRP agents, your, your other agents involved in the federal government can, uh, can, can make all the testimony they want, I presume, under current law. I'm, only, I'm narrowing this discussion to the issue that's before us today and being discussed today, not CRP. Well, not but, but this program, Congressman, don't you see, talks about facilitating a whole series of existing programs many of which provide enormous specific benefits to private property so, owners. So and local if it is your zoning intention. and property rights issues and land management issues are then a part of this. This is, this is maybe, does this explain the reluctance to make the commitment to the committee? If it is your desire to prohibit uh, the use of the Conservation Reserve Program of all of the various NRCS programs, of the grants uh, that are made to private property owners from the Fish and Wildlife Service, if, if it is your uh, intention to prohibit private property owners from receiving the benefits of those programs, uh, your question uh, appears to me to be designed to do that. I can't understand uh, it, why it is you would choose to do that. that. There's an interesting strategy you're trying to employ here, but it's not going to work. And I'll tell you why. It's because the programs that you mentioned, CRP and others, are specifically authorized in statute. This one is not. This is only going to coordinate programs, each one of which is authorized and appropriated by this Congress. That's specifically why there's no request for additional employees. There's no request for additional monies or reprogramming of monies. This is about efficiently and effectively doing our jobs faithfully to execute the law. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I realize I'm tested the patience of the clock here and limiting my, my time. And I'm out of it. But I would merely say that for those who had some question as to why there is great reluctance among Western states to see this program go through unchallenged and uh, without any oversight, I hope their eyes were opened today. Can, uh, it, example after example after example have been cited not only by me but other members of this committee where this administration has in fact betrayed the trust of western states western legislators western governors western uh, western elected officials western delegations of all sorts where where the stated official opinion of those states have been ignored on 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 grand scales time after time after time i would just merely say that the Department of Interior in particular is uh, an agency that we have tried to trust as often as we possibly can, but that patience has just been tested uh, far too frequently. The words of the Department of the Interior just ring hollow among Western ears, and I think it's unfortunate. This could have been a good program, I believe, but the, the, the attitude toward Western states, the reluctance to essentially make the commitments in front of this committee to back up the words that have been expressed, I find very troubling and are precisely the reason we are so skeptical about this program in the West. Thank you. I appreciate the gentleman's comments. I, I appreciate the patience of all of you and being with us. That's very kind of you to spend your time with us today, and we spend a lot of hours here discussing this issue. I think we're going to keep coming back down to the idea of process. I think it's going to come down to the idea of how do you step through it. Many of the things that come out of the administration are very laudatory. I agree with many of them. The other side of the coin, it's the process that bothers us. Many of us spend a lot of time going into the past home state of Secretary Babbitt, Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, Utah, and there's a very tremendous skepticism uh, predicated on some of these areas. Uh, as a gentleman from Colorado pointed out, possibly at the time you could make some definite commitments, it would make life a lot easier for us. Uh, I can tell you that many of the governors out there, both R and Ds, do not want to have things happen in their state without consent. As past Speaker of the House of Utah, I know I would be offended if in that position, if we didn't have at least some people tell us about it. 
It's going to take a while to overcome this last hit of September of 90, uh, 96, believe me. It's going to take a long time for people to get over. So I would hope that uh, when we get into these things, we could keep in mind that we would like to all work together. I think uh, political divisions aren't as important as what's good for the country, and I would hope that would be the case with all of us. I appreciate all three of you being here and the two other folks who uh, joined us. It's been kind of you to be here. This hearing stands adjourned. Thanks, John. Thank you. weekend on C-SPAN 2, about books. On the Saturday night edition, Hermione Lee and her biography on Virginia Woolf. Then historian Rashid Khalidi and his book, Palestinian Identity. And journalist Ross Gelbspan on the science, economics, and the politics of global warming. Sunday night, about books begins with